Good evening, good evening and welcome. About a year and a half ago, I began contacting our two speakers with the intention of setting up a debate between them. It's taken a lot of planning and preparation to get to this point, so I hope you'll all enjoy the show. Uh, I'd like to thank Student Senate and Culture of Quality for providing the funding for it. I'd like to thank our speakers for taking the time out of their schedule to be here. And I'd like to thank our faculty moderator, Dr. Janice Brandon Falcone. I was going to ask you to do that in a minute. Uh, Dr. Falcone is a professor of history here at Northwest and she'll be giving the introductions and telling you guys to turn off your cell phones. Uh, so without further ado, please join me in giving another warm welcome to Dr. Falcone. Can you hear me? Do I need to bring this? Okay. Well, actually, I think we um, need to give Landon Hedrick a very big thanks. At, at Northwest, we like to think that we empower our students, and um, he took this idea and ran with it as long and far as he could, and he is largely the one that we should credit with organizing this, with obtaining funding, with uh, you know checking with faculty. So Landon, give him a great thanks. Um, it's my privilege to introduce the debaters tonight, the speakers, and also to run down a little bit of the rules uh, of the evening. Um, let me introduce uh, Dr. Craig first on my right here. William Lane Craig is a research professor at Talbot School of Theology in La Mirada, California. He earned a doctorate in philosophy at the University of Birmingham, England before taking a doctorate in theology from the Ludwig Maximilians University of Munich, Germany, at which latter institution he was, for two years, a fellow of the Alexander von Humboldt Stiftung, writing on the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus. He spent seven years at the Catholic University in Leuven, Belgium, uh, before taking his post at Talbot in 1994. He has authored or edited over 30 books, including the following. Assessing the New Testament evidence for the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus. Will the real Jesus please stand up? Uh, with, that's not a question to the audience. That's the title of his book. <laughs> and he, he co-authored that book with John Dominic Crossan. And um, Jesus' Resurrection, Fact or Figment with Gerd Ludemann as well as numerous articles in professional journals such as New Testament Studies, Journal for the Study of the New Testament, Expository Times, and Kerygma and Dogma. He and his wife Jan have two children. His website is www.reasonablefaith.org. And he will be debating uh, Dr. Richard Carrier, and um, he is a, a nationally renowned secular author, author of Sense and Goodness Without God, and uh, um, a widely heard speaker and lecturer. Dr. Carrier earned his PhD at Columbia University in ancient history. He specializes in the intellectual history of Greece and Rome, particularly ancient philosophy, religion, and science, with emphasis on the origins of Christianity and the use and progress of science under the Roman Empire. His uh, website is aptly named www.richardcarrier.org. Info. So, now, um, a little briefing on the rules. Um, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have Dr. Craig speak first, and he will speak for about 20 minutes, and then Dr. Carrier will be allowed a 20-minute presentation. Dr. Craig will then have 12 minutes for a rebuttal, and Dr. Uh, Carrier will also have 12 minutes for a rebuttal. Then Dr. Craig will have eight minutes uh, for a rebuttal, and Dr. Carrier, eight minutes for a rebuttal, and then we'll limit their final rebuttals to five minutes each. Um, and then we'll follow that 
uh, with a question and answer period from the audience. Um, a couple of other rules. One is um, I know that people in Northwest Missouri are unfailingly polite and courteous, uh, but sometimes uh, this, this topic might raise people's passions. And uh, I would just uh, ask you to allow courtesy to each speaker uh, without making claps and yells and whistles and boos and uh, whatever. Um, so I would, I would ask that of you, and I know that you're all capable of that. And um, during the question and answer period, I would ask you to confine yourself to a question only. Um, if we have to listen to everybody take a position on this question, uh, we're going to be here until 1 o'clock in the morning. So uh, we'll, we'll have a microphone on that side and a microphone over there. And what I'd like you to do is, if you have a question for Dr. Craig, um, uh, go to that microphone. And a question for Dr. Carrier, go to that microphone. And we'll try to alternate those questions without having you to identify that. So you can identify yourself and, and your question um, by which microphone you're going to. And I'll repeat this at the end of the debate in case you have short-term memory loss or something, OK? So I think those are the rules. And, and um, sit back and relax and, and uh, listen to um, a lively conversation. Thank you. Good evening. I want to begin by thanking the Philosophy Club for the invitation to participate in tonight's debate. And I also uh, am glad for Richard's willingness to participate as well. Now, the question before us this evening is, did Jesus rise from the dead? In my opening speech, I'm going to lay out some reasons why I answer yes to this question. And I presume that Richard will lay out his reasons for saying no. Now, there are at least two ways to a knowledge of Jesus' resurrection, the existential and the historical. Tonight, I want to focus on the historical case for Jesus' resurrection. I realize that the vast majority of Christians have not based their belief in Jesus' resurrection on historical considerations, but on a personal encounter with the living Lord himself. And I think that this existential approach is fully legitimate. But I also think that a good case can be made historically for Jesus' resurrection as well. Now, one doesn't come to a study of Jesus' resurrection in a vacuum, so let me lay out very clearly two presuppositions with which I approach tonight's question. First, I presuppose the existence of God as demonstrated by the arguments of natural theology. This is the approach taken by classical defenders of the resurrection, such as Hugo Grotius, Samuel Clark, and William Paley, as well as by such contemporary scholars as Wolfhard Pannenbach, Richard Swinburne, and Stephen Davis. And it's the approach that I've taken in my published work. Now, I realize that Richard doesn't share this presupposition. He's an atheist who denies that God exists. This is a huge difference which will, of course, radically affect how we assess competing explanations of the facts. But our time and topic are limited tonight, so if we want to debate about the existence of God, we may just have to schedule another debate. Second, I presuppose that our background knowledge includes a good deal of information about the historical Jesus, including his radical personal claims, his teaching, and his crucifixion. In so doing, I stand squarely in the mainstream of New Testament scholarship regarding the historical Jesus. Again, I realize that Richard doesn't share this presupposition. Richard takes the extremist position that Jesus of Nazareth never even existed, that there was no such person in history. This is a position which is so extreme that to call it marginal would be an understatement. It doesn't even appear on the map of contemporary New Testament scholarship. So I'm also very safely situated with respect to my second presupposition. In tonight's debate, then, I propose to defend two major contentions. One, there are four historical facts which must be explained by any adequate historical hypothesis. Jesus' burial, the discovery of his empty tomb, his post-mortem appearances, 
and the origin of his disciples' belief in his resurrection. And two, the best explanation of those facts is that God raised Jesus from the dead. Let's look at that first contention more closely. I want to share four facts which are accepted by the large majority of New Testament historians. Fact number one, after his crucifixion, Jesus was buried by Joseph of Arimathea in a tomb. Scholars have established this, this fact on the basis of evidence such as the following. One, Jesus' burial is multiply attested in early independent sources. The burial account is part of Mark's source material for the story of Jesus' passion. This is a very early source, which is probably based on eyewitness testimony and dates to within a few years of Jesus' crucifixion. Moreover, Paul, in his first letter to the church of Corinth, also cites an extremely early source for Jesus' burial, which most scholars date to within a few years or even months of the crucifixion. Independent testimony to Jesus' burial by Joseph is also found in the special sources behind Matthew and Luke and in the Gospel of John. Historians consider themselves to have hit historical pay dirt when they have two independent sources for the same event. But we have the remarkable number of at least five independent sources for Jesus' burial, some of which are extraordinarily early. Two, as a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin that condemned Jesus, Joseph of Arimathea is unlikely to be a Christian invention. There was an understandable hostility in the early church toward the Jewish leaders. In Christian eyes, they had engineered a judicial murder of Jesus. Thus, according to the eminent New Testament scholar Raymond Brown, Jesus' burial by Joseph is very probable, since it is almost inexplicable why Christians would make up a story about a Jewish Sanhedrist who does what is right by Jesus. For these and many other reasons, most New Testament critics concur with Dale Allison's verdict that all in all, it is highly likely that Jesus' corpse was placed in a tomb by Joseph of Arimathea. Fact number two, on the Sunday after the crucifixion, Jesus' tomb was found empty by a group of his women followers. The wide majority of scholars also concur with this fact. Here, Richard finds himself among that minority of scholars who deny the fact of the empty tomb. He claims that the empty tomb story is a fictional literary creation of Mark. But the reasons which have convinced most scholars of the historicity of Jesus' empty tomb also go to refute Richard's hypothesis. One, the historical reliability of the burial account supports the empty tomb. If the account of Jesus' burial is accurate, then the site of Jesus' grave was known in Jerusalem to Jew and Christian alike. In that case, it's a very short inference to the historicity of the empty tomb. So long as a corpse lay interred in Joseph's tomb, a Christian movement in Jerusalem, founded on belief in the resurrection of Jesus, would never have arisen. Two, the empty tomb is multiply attested in independent early sources. Mark's passion source didn't end with Jesus' burial, but with the story of the empty tomb, which is tied to the burial account verbally and grammatically. Moreover, Matthew and John rely on independent sources about the empty tomb. Jesus' empty tomb is also mentioned in the early sermons independently preserved in the Acts of the Apostles, and it's implied in the very old tradition handed on by Paul in his first letter to the Corinthian church. Thus we have multiple early attestation of the fact of the empty tomb in at least four independent sources. Therefore, it can't be a Markan literary creation, as Richard imagines. Three, the tomb was discovered empty by women. In patriarchal Jewish society, the testimony of women was not highly regarded. In fact, the ancient Jewish historian Josephus says that on account of their boldness and levity, women shouldn't even be permitted to serve as witnesses in a Jewish court of law. Now, in light of this fact, how remarkable it is that it is women who are the discoverers of Jesus' empty tomb. 
Any later legendary account would certainly have made male disciples, like Peter and John, discover the empty tomb. The fact that it is women rather than men who are the chief witnesses to the empty tomb is best explained by the fact that they were the discoverers of the empty tomb and the gospel writers faithfully record what for them was an awkward and embarrassing fact. Four, the story is simple and lacks theological embellishment. Mark's empty tomb story is uncolored by the theological and apologetical motifs that would be characteristic of a Christian creation. For example, it's remarkable that in Mark's account, the resurrection of Jesus is not actually described at all. Contrast later forged gospels in which Jesus is seen emerging from the tomb in glory to a multitude of witnesses. In Mark's account, there's no proof from prophecy cited, no mention of Jesus' descent into hell, no heralding of a new eon, no description of or reflection on the resurrection body, not even any use of glorious titles for Christ. At the very most, the critical historian would want to excise from Mark's account the angelic figure as an embellishment. And what remains is stark in its simplicity. Mark's story has all the earmarks of a very primitive tradition which is free of theological and apologetical reflection. This tells powerfully against Richard's hypothesis of Markan literary creation. Five, the earliest Jewish polemic presupposes the empty tomb. In the 28th chapter of Matthew, we find a Christian attempt to refute the earliest Jewish polemic against the resurrection. What were Jews saying in response to the disciples' proclamation? He is risen from the dead. That his tomb uh, still contained his body there in the hillside? That the disciples were crazy? No. They said the disciples stole away his body. Now think about that for a moment. The disciples stole away his body. The earliest Jewish response to the proclamation of the resurrection was itself an attempt to explain why the body was missing. And thus the testimony of the very adversaries of the early Christian movement supports the historicity of the empty tomb. I could go on, but I think that enough has been said to indicate why, in the words of Jakob Kramer, an Austrian specialist in this field, by far most exegetes hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements concerning the empty tomb. Now, Richard's main objection to the empty tomb is that Paul didn't believe in the empty tomb. Paul supposedly thought that the resurrection body is a spiritual body wholly distinct from the corpse in the tomb. Now, if this is supposed to be an argument against the empty tomb, then there's a massive assumption lying just beneath the surface, namely that we have no early independent evidence for the empty tomb. But we've just seen five lines of such evidence. So even if Paul believed on theological grounds that a resurrection doesn't require an empty tomb, that does nothing to deny the historical fact that Jesus' tomb was found empty. In any case, the key issue here is not whether our resurrection bodies will be radically different from our present earthly bodies. Rather, the key question is, how does the resurrection body come to be? Is it by transformation of the earthly body or by exchanging the earthly body for another body? Let me mention briefly four reasons to think that Paul believed in a transformation of the earthly body to the resurrection body. First, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is clearly speaking of intrinsic change, not exchange. The Greek verb alasso has the same range of meanings as our English word change. Sometimes it means intrinsic change in a single subject. For example, we say to an old friend, my, how you've changed. Sometimes it can mean exchange, as when we say, I changed money at the airport. Now, as Richard himself says, when interpreting words and phrases, context is everything. When a lasso is used as exchange, the verb typically takes a direct object or prepositional phrase. For example, in Romans 1.23, 
Paul says, they exchanged the glory of God for images. Now, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul never says we shall change bodies. Rather, he says, the trumpet will sound and we shall be changed. The passage only makes sense as intrinsic change. Second, Paul's verbs of sowing and raising have the same implicit subject. It is sown, it is raised. Four times Paul repeats this. To escape the implication of numerical identity, Richard is forced to mistranslate the passage so that the verbs take different subjects. One is sown, one, that is another one, is raised. Thirdly, Paul's use of the pronoun this points to our mortal bodies or nature that must be changed. Four times he says, this perishable must put on imperishability. This mortal must put on immortality, indicating the transformation that must take place in our mortal bodies. And fourth, Paul elsewhere speaks of the change that our mortal bodies will undergo in the resurrection. Philippians 3.21, he will change our lowly body to be similar to his glorious body. Romans 8, 10 and 11, he who raised Christ from the dead will make alive your mortal bodies also. Romans 8.23, we await adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For these and other reasons, the vast majority of contemporary commentators agree that in the resurrection, Paul envisages a transformation of the earthly body. Accordingly, we can say, no corpse left behind. Fact number three, on different occasions and under various circumstances, different individuals and groups of people experienced appearances of Jesus alive from the dead. This is a fact which is virtually universally acknowledged among New Testament scholars and by Richard as well for the following reasons. One, Paul's list of eyewitnesses to Jesus' resurrection appearances guarantees that such appearances occurred. Paul tells us that Jesus appeared to his chief disciple, Peter, then to the inner circle of disciples known as the Twelve. Then he appeared to a group of 500 disciples at once. Then to his younger brother, James, who up to that time was apparently not a believer, then to all the apostles. Finally, Paul adds, he appeared also to me at the time when Paul was still a non-believing persecutor of the early Jesus movement. Given the early date of Paul's information, as well as his personal acquaintance with the people involved, such appearances cannot be dismissed as unhistorical. And second, the appearance narratives in the Gospels provide multiple independent attestation of the appearances. The appearance narrative spans such a breadth of independent sources that it cannot be reasonably denied that the earliest disciples did have such experiences. Thus, even the skeptical New Testament critic, Gert Ludemann, concludes, it may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. Finally, fact number four, the original disciples suddenly and sincerely came to believe that Jesus was risen from the dead despite their having every predisposition to the contrary. Think of the situation the disciples faced following Jesus' crucifixion. Number one, their leader was dead, and Jewish messianic expectations had no idea of a Messiah who, instead of triumphing over Israel's enemies, would be humiliatingly executed by them as a criminal. Two, Jewish beliefs about the afterlife precluded anyone's rising from the dead to glory and immortality before the general resurrection of the dead at the end of the world. Nevertheless, the original disciples suddenly came to believe so strongly that God had raised Jesus from the dead that they were willing to die for the truth of that belief. But then the obvious question arises, what caused them to believe such an unJewish and outlandish thing? Luke Johnson, a New Testament scholar at Emory University, muses, some sort of powerful transformative experience is required to generate the sort of movement earliest Christianity was. N.T. Wright, an eminent New Testament historian, concludes, that is why, as an historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind him.
In summary, then, there are four facts agreed upon by the majority of scholars who have written on the subject. Jesus' burial, his empty tomb, his post-mortem appearances, and the origin of the disciples' belief in his resurrection. That brings us then to the second major contention, that the best explanation of these facts is that God raised Jesus from the dead. In his book, Justifying Historical Descriptions, historian C.B. McCullough lists six tests which historians use in determining what is the best explanation for given historical facts. The hypothesis, God raised Jesus from the dead, passes all of these tests. One, it has great explanatory scope. It explains all four of the facts before us. Two, it has great explanatory power. It explains each fact well. Three, it is plausible. Given the historical context of Jesus' own unparalleled life and claims, the resurrection serves as divine confirmation of those claims. Four, it is not ad hoc or contrived. It requires only one additional hypothesis, that God exists, which I take to be established by the arguments of natural theology. Five, it is in accord with accepted beliefs. The hypothesis, God raised Jesus from the dead, in no way conflicts with the accepted belief that people don't rise naturally from the dead. I accept that belief as wholeheartedly as I accept the hypothesis that God raised Jesus from the dead. And finally, number six, it far outstrips any rival theories in meeting conditions one to five. No naturalistic hypothesis has attracted a great number of scholars. On the basis of what I've said then, I think that the best explanation of the facts is the one that the original eyewitnesses gave, that God raised Jesus from the dead. Today, the rational man can hardly be blamed if he concludes that on that first Easter morning, a divine miracle occurred. I'm going to cut to the chase. Dr. Craig has only two sources of historical evidence in reality, the epistles and the gospels. Point blank, my argument is the gospels have no relevant value as historical sources, and the epistles don't tell us anything we can prove was unnatural. First up, the gospels record myth, not history. I wanted to, I wanted to debate that subject with Dr. Craig today, but he didn't want to, so now I can only give you some examples proving my point so I can leave room to discuss the many other topics in this debate. Uh, but I can assure you, if I had more time, these examples could be multiplied a dozen times over. One of the clearest examples of myth-making in the Gospels is the Barabbas narrative. According to Mark, the Romans occupying Judea had a custom of releasing a prisoner every year on the Jewish holiday, whoever the Jews voted for. So Pilate asks the Jews if they want him to release Jesus Christ. And instead, the chief priests convince everyone to ask for Barabbas instead, a convicted murderer who had rebelled against Rome. Now, there is no evidence the Romans ever had such a custom of releasing just any prisoner the Jews wanted. Nor is it all, at all plausible the Romans certainly would not let loose a murderer and a traitor, least of all because the very people who rebelled asked them to. But Mark's story clearly copies an actual ritual, ritual the Jews performed at their temple every year at Yom Kippur. Two goats would be selected. One would be chosen to be the scapegoat, and all the sins of Israel would be placed upon it, and it would be released into the wild to be claimed by the devil. While the other goat would be sacrificed, and its blood would atone for the sins of all Israel. Now, as it happens, Barabbas is a fake name. In Aramaic, it means son of the father. So here we have two sons of the father, Barabbas and Jesus. One who carries the sins of Israel, murder and rebellion, and is released to the mob, and the other whose blood atones for the sins of all Israel. So here we have a historically unbelievable story involving a man with a fake name that nevertheless carries deep symbolic meaning. By definition, that's a myth. This story has been constructed by the author for its symbolism. It's not a historical report of anything that actually happened. 
Now, there are many more examples like this surveyed in the works of biblical scholars like Randall Helms and Thomas Brody and Burton Mack and Jonathan Reed and Helmut Coaster and many more. As scholars have long known, all the Gospels are filled to the brim with stories deliberately constructed for their symbolic and literary meaning rather than their historical verity. For example, one indicator of myth is the inclusion of implausibly convenient story structure, what literary scholars call deliberate irony. Mark, for example, has Jesus constantly talking about the reversal of expectation as the message of the gospel, teaching with many parables that the least shall be first, the high will be brought low, the meek shall inherit the earth, the poor shall be rich, and so on. So it's a rather implausible coincidence when the actual narrative of Mark's story is filled with remarkably convenient reversals of expectation. James and John, who asked to sit at the right and left of Jesus in his glory, are replaced by two thieves on his right and left at his crucifixion. Simon Peter, Christ's right-hand man, who was told he had to deny himself and take up his cross and follow, denies Christ instead and is replaced by a different Simon, Simon of Cyrene, a stranger who actually, actually takes up his cross and follows. Likewise, contrary to expectation, Christ's own people, the Jews, mock their own savior, while it is a Gentile officer of Rome who recognizes his divinity. And the male disciples abandon Jesus while the women truly follow him and are thus the first to learn of his resurrection, proving again that the least shall be first, and on and on. Countless elements of Mark's story involve deliberately fabricated irony like this. Another indicator of myth is the construction of stories, even down to the specific details, using material from the Old Testament. It's well known, for example, that Mark constructs his crucifixion narrative using material from Psalm 22, the casting of lots for his clothes, Jesus' cry on the cross, the taunts of the crowd, all come from that psalm, often verbatim. But as I show in the empty tomb, Mark also constructed his empty tomb narrative using material from Genesis, Ecclesiastes, Chronicles, and Psalm 24 in a similar way. Another indicator of myth is the inclusion of deliberate parallels and inversions of other myths. For example, Luke tells the story of a man named Cleopas who journeys on the road from Jerusalem to Emmaus after the corpse of Jesus has vanished when the resurrected Jesus appears to him and explains the secrets of the kingdom. Then he vanishes, and Cleopas goes on to proclaim what he was told. As it happens, the name Cleopas conveniently means tell all. In other words, proclaim. Moreover, this tale exactly emulates and in deliberate ways inverts a story already celebrated every year in Rome, and in that other story, a man named Proculus, whose name also means proclaim, journeys on the road from Alba Longa to Rome after the corpse of Romulus has vanished. And just like Jesus, the resurrected Romulus appears and explains the secrets of empire. Then he vanishes, and Proculus goes on to proclaim what he was told. In both stories, the men are journeying from east to west, toward the sea, along the path of the sun, from the city on a mountain to a city in a valley, and in both stories, the distance of the road is exactly the same, 14 miles. This, these similarities are too numerous to be a coincidence. Again, this is deliberate symbolic fiction. And like many myths, the way the story is changed is the whole point. The similarities tell us what story to compare it to, while the differences tell us what the author wants us to learn from that comparison. Romulus told Proculus that if the Romans are virtuous, they will conquer the world. But Jesus told Cleopas that the virtuous will join a spiritual kingdom instead of a physical one. Romulus appeared in immense glory, as befit his message of glory, but Jesus appeared in humble disguise, as befit his message of humility. And while Proculus receives his gospel on the road to Rome, Cleopas receives his gospel on the road from Jerusalem. So while the old story implies all roads lead to Rome, the new story implies all roads lead from Jerusalem. In almost every detail, the stories are identical or exactly the reverse. Another indicator of myth is the reification of imaginary people into real people. In the Gospel of John, for example, a new character is invented, Lazarus, whom Jesus raises from the dead, an amazing event none of the other Gospels apparently had ever heard of, suddenly appears in John. In John chapter 11, this Lazarus is identified as the one whom Jesus loved, who is later cited as a witness for the details of the crucifixion and resurrection, again appearing in those narratives exactly where none of the other Gospels ever imagined him before. And yet we know this Lazarus didn't exist for he first appears in Luke's gospel as a fictional person in a parable, where Jesus tells a story about a rich man burning in hell who sees a dead beggar named Lazarus in heaven, 
So he begs God to raise this Lazarus from the dead so he can warn his living brothers to avoid his own hellish fate. The parable ends with God refusing, telling him, if they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. Notice what happens in John. He reverses the message of Luke's parable by having Jesus actually raise Lazarus from the dead, which convinces many people to turn and be saved. The very thing Luke's Jesus said wouldn't work. In fact, just as the rejected request in Luke's parable imagined Lazarus going to people and convincing them, John's Lazarus is then cited as a witness to the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus specifically to convince people. Again, what Luke's Jesus said wouldn't work. John has thus reified a fictional character and integrated him into the story where he never was before in order to argue against the particular message in Luke, seeking instead to persuade people with the very outcome Luke said wouldn't persuade them. Another indicator of myth is the acceptance of wildly contradictory versions of the same myth. For example, Matthew's gospel wildly contradicts Mark's empty tomb narrative in almost every detail, elaborating it with incredible claims of posted guards and flying superhuman angels magically paralyzing people and hurling about tombstones. Again, in the empty tomb, I demonstrate where all these crazy changes came from. Matthew completely rewrote the empty tomb story in Mark in order to portray Jesus as a new Daniel in the lion's den borrowing exact words, phrases, and details from the book of Daniel in order to construct this new story. Okay, I've only given you a few examples, but all the Gospels are full of mythical narratives like this, cover to cover, where stories are constructed symbolically, mining the Jewish scriptures and pagan myths for symbolic details. Histories are not written this way. These are myths, the telling of implausible tales that never happened, but are constructed with symbolic meaning. The Gospels routinely invent even very public events that never happened. Mark invents a darkness covering the whole world for three hours that no one else saw. Matthew invents a rock-splitting earthquake no one else noticed, as well as a horde of resurrected corpses parading into Jerusalem, leaving hundreds of empty tombs behind, which again no other author had ever seen or heard of, and on and on. As with these events, and Barabbas, and the guards at the tomb, and so on, the, gospels, the Gospel authors routinely made up entire people and events simply to communicate their message through symbols, metaphors, and parables. That means we can't trust anything they say is historical, since we know for a fact from these very examples and many others that they were writing symbolic fiction. We have no reason, therefore, to believe their empty tomb narratives or their appearance narratives were anything more than symbolic fiction as well. Even if some history is lost in there somewhere, having no other sources, we have no way of knowing which details are historical and which made up. And therefore, no evidence in the Gospels can be used to argue for the resurrection of Jesus. So we can't trust what the Gospels say. What do the epistles say? Paul says in Galatians 1, I make known to you, brethren, that the Gospel I preached is not according to any man. For neither did I receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, except through a revelation of Jesus Christ, when it was the good pleasure of God to reveal his Son in me, so I could preach him among the Gentiles. I did not confer with flesh and blood right away, nor did I go to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before me, but I went off into Arabia, and then back to Damascus. Then only after three years did I go to Jerusalem to visit Kephos. And even then, I remained unknown by face to any of the churches in Judea. So Paul tells us he received the gospel by revelation, not human testimony. What gospel does he mean? He tells us that in 1 Corinthians 15. For I make known to you, brethren, the gospel that I preached to you, which you also accepted, and in which you now stand. For I delivered to you, first of all, what I also received, that according to the scriptures, Christ died for our sins, and that he was buried, and that according to the scriptures, he was raised on the third day, and that he appeared to Kephos and many others, and last of all, he appeared also to me. Note that Paul begins both statements in Galatians and 1 Corinthians with the exact same phrase, I make known to you, brethren, that this is the gospel I preached. So Paul tells us the gospel he preached was not handed down to him through any human testimony. He learned it directly from God through a revelation. And he says this in the same gospel he handed down, he says this is the same gospel he handed down to his congregations. He even went on preaching it for three whole years before he spoke to any apostles about it. And he even says that in all that time he was completely unknown to anyone in Judea. Now, modern science has confirmed that experiences like this are commonly hallucinations. In fact, we have no scientific evidence that any such visions are not hallucinations. And since fully realistic visions like this happen throughout the world, confirming countless contradictory sects and traditions, we can be sure of one thing. 
Even if any of these experiences are real, most of them by far are not. The burden is therefore on anyone who would claim his visions real and all others hallucinatory. But there's no evidence that confirms these early Christian visions were an exception. So most likely they were hallucinations, just like all other religious visions in history, as many scholars argue. Paul even tells us what inspired these hallucinations. He says the scriptures told him the Christ would raise, that the Christ would rise from the dead. So inspired by scripture, he and others hallucinated a Jesus telling them exactly that. And Paul makes no relevant distinction between his experience and anyone else's. As far as the epistles tell us, as far as we can tell, all the apostles learned of the resurrection of Jesus through scripture-inspired hallucinations. Since there is no evidence in the epistles of the apostles having any evidence for the resurrection other than religiously motivated hallucinations, Paul never mentions, for example, the discovery of an empty tomb. And since we know hallucinations are fabrications of the mind, these experiences cannot be used as evidence for an actual resurrection of Jesus. Instead, the epistles prove the early Christians were frequent hallucinators. Paul had visions quite often. Several times in his letters, he mentions receiving commandments and instructions directly from a heavenly Jesus. He once even relates an entire conversation he had with God. And he implies he, or someone he knew, had actually visited heaven in one of these visions and saw and heard all kinds of marvelous things there. And it's clear Paul completely believes all of this. Paul reveals that many other Christians in his churches were hallucinating on a regular basis as well. He writes entire sections about the brethren entering ecstatic trances and prophesying and relaying communications of spirits and speaking in tongues. The book of Acts confirms all of this, including several instances of Christians having visions of beings and objects in the sky that no one else saw. This was happening so frequently in Christian churches that Paul even had to establish rules for it. Now, Science has documented a particular type of person called a schizotypal personality, who frequently hallucinates, but unlike the full-blown schizophrenic, is not impaired by their hallucinations, but instead gains comfort and confidence from them. In antiquity, such people would obviously gravitate towards the acceptance of ecstatic religious movements, like the many mystical Jewish sects of the time, which also reported hallucinations they took to be real communications from God. The Christians came from this very background, we now know many modern examples of such movements, the Shakers, the Santeros, the cargo cults, which arise, like Christianity did, in subcultures that sanction and revere hallucinatory experience, treating it as genuine and authoritative. Now, if someone came knocking on your door and told you Victor Hugo had risen from the dead, and you asked them how they knew that, and all they could tell you was that Mr. Hugo had appeared to them in a vision and told them so, and then you visited their church and saw everyone there was channeling spirits and speaking in tongues and having visions of angels and strange objects in the sky, would you believe them? No, you wouldn't. Yet these early Christians were exactly like this. And the epistles tell us they had their information about Jesus from no other sources than these, visions, revelations, and communications from the spirit world. That's not going to convince you Victor Hugo rose from the dead, so it shouldn't convince you Jesus did either. Okay, what about the body? Since the Gospels can't be trusted, and the epistles never mention a missing body, it's quite possible there was none. The Christians may have simply believed there was, and rejected all evidence to the contrary as a trick. A friend of mine, a colleague of mine, even told me that he had a conversation with Dr. Craig in which he presented evidence, if, if there was evidence refuting the resurrection, Dr. Craig said he would dismiss it as a trick. So the first Christians may have done so too. Or they might have believed, as I argue in the empty tomb, that Jesus rose in an entirely new body, leaving the old one still in the tomb. We'll be debating that possibly later. In the book of Acts, for example, however, the authorities show no knowledge of any body having gone missing. There are no accusations of theft or escape, no investigations, nothing. Christians aren't questioned about it, which entails either the author of Acts is hiding something, or there was no missing body for the authorities to question or investigate or make accusations about. And yet, even if a body really did go missing, most missing bodies don't go missing because they rose from the dead. So to prove this missing body is different, you have to rule out all the other ways bodies usually go missing, and we can't do that with the evidence we have. All right, now let's step back and actually think about what Craig wants you to believe here. A walking corpse, indeed, according to the Gospels, a flying and teleporting corpse, could have visited Pontius Pilate, Herod and Typhus, the Sanhedrin, the population of Jerusalem, the Roman legions, even the emperor and senate of Rome. He could have flown to America and preached to the natives, as the Mormons actually believe he did. Or even to China, preaching in all the temples and courts of Asia, 
In fact, being God, he could have appeared to everyone on earth. He could visit me right now, or you. He could appear on this stage. And yet, instead, Craig believes Jesus only appeared to a few small groups of his already fanatical followers in Judea and just one other obscure guy in the desert of Damascus just one brief time 2,000 years ago, and that's it. If Jesus was a god and really wanted to save us all, he wouldn't do that. He would have appeared and delivered his gospel personally to the whole world. But if Christianity originated as a movement inspired by schizotypal hallucinations, like every other vision-based religion, like the Shakers or cargo cults, then we'd expect it to arise in only one small group, in one small place and time, exactly where schizotypes were respected as prophets and their hallucinations believed to be divine communications, and exactly where ideas of resurrections and messiahs were already heavily preached and believed in. And that's exactly when and where it began. A natural explanation thus predicts all the evidence we have, whereas Craig only has an unnatural explanation, which is entirely falsified by predicting things we don't see at all. Now, one last point I'll make in the given time that I have. Dr. Craig has on other debates, for example, in his debate with Victor Stenger, said that if there are natural explanations available, we should prefer those to supernatural explanations. I've given you fairly good naturalistic explanations for how the evidence came to exist. There isn't any evidence to refute those naturalistic explanations. We can't rule them out. So what we have here is an argument that completely bypasses what Dr. Craig is talking about. A lot of the points he made are actually irrelevant in light of what I've argued here today. Now, he's said uh, one thing in particular that I'll respond to in my last minute here. He pointed out that uh, I actually argue that Jesus didn't exist. That's not strictly speaking true. Uh, I argue that it's a hypothesis that needs to be considered that I find persuasive, but I have consistently argued in public many times that this is a theory, this is a hypothesis that needs to be subjected to peer review, needs to be uh, moved through and generate a consensus before we can argue it. So in this debate here today, I am completely assuming that the consensus is correct, that Jesus existed. I'm even agreeing with uh, Dr. Craig's argument that Jesus was buried. Completely agree with that. That's the consensus position. Until we can actually argue against it and present evidence against it, we should go with that. And the appearances, I also agree, obviously, that there were appearances, but I argue that the appearances were hallucinations. There isn't really any evidence to discount that. And I'll end with that, and we'll continue more later on. I know that Richard wanted to debate tonight the general reliability of the Gospels, and I'm really sorry that he's chosen to pursue that tack, despite our agreement that that wouldn't be the topic tonight. But let me just say a couple of words about this. In the first place, the vast majority of scholars do not think that the Gospels are of the genre of myth, but rather of historical biography. R.T. France, a New Testament scholar, writes, at the level of their literary and historical character, we have good reason to treat the Gospels seriously as a source of information on the life and teaching of Jesus. Ancient historians have sometimes commented that the degree of skepticism with which New Testament scholars approach their sources is far greater than would be thought justified in any other branch of ancient history. Indeed, many ancient historians would count themselves fortunate to have four such responsible accounts written within a generation or two of the events. The decision as to how far a scholar is willing to accept the record that they offer is likely to be influenced more by his openness to a supernaturalist worldview than by strictly historical considerations. The majority of New Testament scholars today recognize that the Gospels are not of the genre of myth. They're of the genre of ancient biography. According to Craig Keener, a Gospel scholar, all four Gospels fit the general genre of ancient biography, the life of a prominent person. And these biographies have a historical interest. Keener says that the Gospels use recent traditions and that those that can be checked are careful in their use of sources suggest that the Gospels should be placed among the most reliable of ancient biographies. Just to take one example, the example of Barabbas, the acclamation of the people, acclamatio populi, played a significant role in Roman legal administration. And there are numerous examples of Roman magistrates 
who heeded a crowd's wishes. For example, in Egypt in AD 85, the Roman governor released an accused to the crowd even though he deserved a scourging. And why couldn't someone in that time be named Bar Abbas? That would symbolize uh, son of the father. There's nothing the matter with that as a Jewish name. So I don't think that uh, you can impugn the evidence for the resurrection by a sort of general attack upon the gospel's reliability. Most scholars think that the four facts that I outlined are part of the historical core of the gospel, however you might want to judge other things in the gospels. Now, before we look at those four facts, Richard did ask a general question. Why did Jesus appear only to the disciples and not to everyone? Well, the New Testament is clear that the purpose of the appearances was for commissioning the disciples for the task of world mission, not for convincing people in general that Jesus was risen from the dead. People who haven't yet heard the gospel won't be judged on the same basis as those who have. People will only be judged on the basis of the information that they have. Now, with that out of the way, let's look at those four facts uh, on which I based my case tonight. First, the burial of Jesus. We saw that it was multiply attested and that Joseph of Arimathea is the historical person who buried Jesus and Richard had no response to either of these two lines of evidence. Secondly, I talked about the support for the empty tomb. First, the burial account supports the accuracy of the empty tomb story, no response from Richard. Secondly, I said the empty tomb story is multiply attested, both in Mark's pre-Mark and Passion story and in independent sources. Here, Richard reiterated his point that the Passion story is constructed out of Old Testament motifs, and I think that's simply false. As Joel Green points out, studies of the use of the Old Testament at Qumran among apocalyptists and in post-biblical historiography indicate that biblical texts were adapted to fit events more readily than were events created to fit biblical texts. In other words, in light of the events that had happened, they would go to the Old Testament to look for proof texts for those events. They don't create the events out of the Old Testament texts. Moreover, the Passion narrative includes events for which no parallel exists in the Old Testament. For example, the anointing at Bethany, the sword incident at Jesus' arrest, Simon of Cyrene and his two sons, the tearing of the temple veil, and so forth. And finally, third, the Passion story did not use obvious motifs from the Old Testament. For example, despite Psalm 22 saying, they have pierced my hands and feet, the Passion story doesn't say that Jesus was nailed to the cross. Uh, for all we know, he could have been tied with ropes. So they didn't use uh, this Old Testament motif from Psalm 22 to create the Passion story. In any case, I also indicated that there are multiple early sources for the uh, fact of the empty tomb. Matthew uses an independent source, as is evident from the non matthean vocabulary in his account, and the fact that he's responding to a pre matthean tradition about the empty tomb. John is recognized to be independent of the Synoptic Gospels. Luke and John have the story of Peter and John visiting the empty tomb, thus indicating an independent tradition of Mark. The sermons in Acts are independent of Mark. Uh, and Paul's tradition is pre-Pauline. That's the point that Richard doesn't seem to understand. It's irrelevant whether Paul learned things by revelation. What he quotes in 1 Corinthians 15 is a pre-Pauline tradition that goes back within the first few years or even months of the crucifixion. So we have this wealth of multiple independent early attestation in support of the fact of the empty tomb. I mentioned that it was also attested by women witnesses, and Richard didn't respond to that point. Fine. Then fourthly, I said it's uh, simple and doesn't show signs of literary embellishment. Here Richard says, well, yes, it does. It shows the reversal of expectations motif in the Gospel of Mark. I'm sorry, that's, that's simply not true. There is no such reversal of expectation motif in the Gospel of Mark. Rather, as Robert Gundry points out in his uh, commentary on Mark, Mark's gospel is dominated by things happening just as Jesus predicted. It is all about the fulfillment of expectations. The final words spoken at the empty tomb in the gospel of Mark are, just as he told you. So Richard's examples, I think, are just fanciful. They're, they're in his own imagination only. Mark is not about the reversal of expectations, but the fulfillment of expectations.
Fifthly, I said that the earliest Jewish polemic presupposes the empty tomb. Richard says, well, uh, Matthew's account of the guard is constructed from the story of Daniel in the lion's den. That's irrelevant. That's wholly beside the point. The point is that what motivated Matthew to either tell or make up his story was that Jews were saying that the disciples had stolen the body. That's what motivated Matthew. And therefore, we have evidence from the early adversaries of Christianity that, in fact, the tomb was empty. So I think we have very good grounds on all five of these uh, lines of support for thinking that, in fact, the tomb of Jesus was found empty. I then uh, argued that Richard's own attempt to undermine the empty tomb by appeal to Paul is ultimately vain because Paul himself believed in a transformation of the body in the tomb and therefore would believe in the empty tomb. Uh, in the empty tomb. Thirdly, we talked about the two lines of evidence in favor of the appearances, and Richard admits that these occurred. He merely tries to explain them away as hallucinations, and we'll deal with that in a moment. Finally, number four, the origin of the Christian faith. Again, we saw that what the disciples came to proclaim and believe was completely contrary to Jewish expectations, and therefore requires some sort of radical transformative experience to account for what happened to them. Now, given that those are the four facts that are accepted by the majority of New Testament scholars today for the reasons that I've laid out, the question then is, what is the best explanation of these facts? And here, Richard talks about hallucinations occurring, uh, perhaps theft of the body or some such thing. I want to suggest that none of these naturalistic explanations really stack up when they're assessed by the criteria that I mentioned in my first speech. Just look at them. First of all, explanatory scope. The apparent death theory, the theft theory, the wrong tomb theory, only try to explain the empty tomb. The hallucination theory only tries to explain the appearances. No naturalistic theory can explain all four facts before us. And as Richard says, in another context, the sign of a good theory is its ability to explain all the data by the same single thesis. So the resurrection hypothesis exceeds these naturalistic theories in explanatory scope. Secondly, explanatory power. No naturalistic theory does a good job of explaining the origin of the disciples' belief in Jesus' resurrection. Theft and wrong tomb theories don't explain why the disciples would come to this outlandish and un-Jewish conclusion that God had raised Jesus from the dead. Hallucinations of the dead, however real, don't lead to belief that the person is alive. As N.T. Wright says, in the ancient world, visions of the dead were not taken as evidence that they were alive. They were taken as evidence that they were dead. And besides that, visions of the exalted Jesus would have most have led to the conclusion that he had been assumed into heaven, which is a different category in Jewish thought from resurrection from the dead. Thirdly, plausibility. The apparent death theory is utterly implausible medically and physically. The pious theft theory is anachronistic in attributing to Jesus' disciples the motive to either fake his assumption or resurrection. And the followers of no messianic movement uh, through the first century before Jesus to, to the first century after Jesus ever did or claimed such a thing about their executed uh, would-be messiah. The wrong tomb or relocation theories are implausible because once the disciples began to preach Jesus' resurrection, the Jewish leadership would have been only too glad to point out the disciples' stupid error in going to the wrong place. The hallucination theory is implausible in trying to psychoanalyze past historical figures. You can't do that, and that's why psychobiography is a failed genre of historical writing. Thus, Richard calls Paul a happy schizoid in his work, and he calls Mary a psychotic. You can't do that responsibly. You can't do psychoanalysis on historical figures. Besides, the diversity and the number of the experiences outstrip anything in the psychological case books. Number four, the theory must not be ad hoc. The wicked witch theory that uh, Richard has propagated is ad hoc because there's no evidence whatsoever, literary or archeological, of the use of human body parts in healing or necromancy in first century Israel. To postulate such practices in Judea, and especially Jerusalem, is completely ad hoc. Now, I could go on, but the point is that on virtually every count, naturalistic theories are inferior to the resurrection hypothesis.
Look, in all honesty, I think that we have to say the only reason the skeptic rejects the resurrection hypothesis is because of his aversion to miracles. But if God exists, as my argument presupposes, then how can you say justifiably that it's improbable that God would raise Jesus from the dead? The real question is this then, how open are you to the existence of God? That was an enormous shotgun of arguments, I must say. Uh, there's no way I'll be able to address them all. So I'm going to cut to the chase of the important items that, are, that were brought up. The first item is, he ended there with the argument that I reject the resurrection because I reject miracles. That actually isn't the case I'm making today. The case that I'm making today is most bodies that go missing don't go missing because of miracles. Most dead people who are seen aren't, most dead people and most gods who are seen are seen through hallucinations. Therefore, the presupposition must be that even the conjunction of these two causes is more naturalistically common than the supernatural op alternative, even if there are miracles that, miracle, miraculous ex cases of this, even if there are miraculous missing bodies, even if there are miraculous appearances of resurrected people. Most resurrection claims do not involve actual resurrections, and there are dozens and dozens of resurrection claims in the ancient world like this. So the same thing would have to be argued that we should prefer naturalistic explanations until we can rule them out, and we don't have sufficient evidence to rule them out. Now, another thing he pointed out was, why resurrection? Why would they believe that Jesus was raised from the dead? Well, one reason is that the conjunction of items in Scripture, Daniel, Isaiah, the wisdom of Solomon, all create this character of the Messiah who's going to be executed. They can see it. Daniel says, the Messiah shall be executed, yet there is no judgment upon him. Isaiah speaks of a similar innocent man who will be executed even though there is no judgment upon him. And this man will die for the sins of Israel, and then God will exalt him and his days will be prolonged, and he'll be executed despite. The wisdom of Solomon has a similar thing where he'll be resurrected, and he'll be rewarded for being executed with resurrection. And we also have a recent inscription found with the Apocalypse of Gabriel which says that the Messiah will be resurrected on the third day, exactly as Paul says. So here we have a conjunction of scriptural passages that could have inspired the Christians to actually come to this belief. When their Messiah died, when their holy man died, Jesus, they would be looking for any explanation for why, they, why that happened, how that could actually be part of God's plan. And they would pour through the scriptures, and Paul says that's where they found these things. In Romans 16, verse 25 to 26, he talks about how there were hidden messages in scripture that they were, that they were finding that were communicating to them aspects of the gospel. So they were looking at scripture for these very things. Now Paul calls the resurrection of Jesus the first fruits of the general resur resurrection. And he repeatedly says, of course in his letters, that the end of the world is coming soon. So imagining the resurrection of Jesus seems to have been the cult's way of proving to themselves that God had sent a decisive sign the end was nigh. The resurrection of Jesus meant the end of the world was coming. It was the beginning of the general resurrection. So because they believed the end of the world was coming, presumably because Jesus taught this, which is entirely possible, they were primed to believe Jesus had been raised, as scripture in fact promised of God's chosen. Now, that's entirely plausible. We don't have enough evidence to confirm any particular theories or to refute any particular theories. It's maybe, it's not ad hoc because it's an actual, natural, plausible hypothesis, and we don't have any further evidence to rely on to actually build what caused these particular visions and what caused this particular message, what caused them to find a particular message in the Old Testament. All religions are unique in their own way in forming their point of view. Now with regard to the empty tomb, uh, Dr. Craig briefly mentioned at one point that the majority of scholars accept the empty tomb. That's actually not true. Uh, I, I assume this is based on Gary Habermas's article in the Journal of the Study of Historical Jesus in June 2005, where Habermas made the claim that 75% of scholars accept the empty tomb. That's actually not a very high percent as far as consensus goes. 25% of scholars would be actually a sizable uh, minority objection. But in fact, that's not what Habermas measured. He measured 75% of authors who've published for or against the empty tomb. Those who understand statistics might know what's going on with that number. No control for publication bias. If believers are publishing more articles defending the empty tomb, then the percentages will be skewed. There's also a small sample size, only 37 authors who published on this subject. 
He also excluded agnostics. So all the scholars who aren't sure whether the empty tomb is uh, a yes or no on that are not counted in his, in, his, in his percentage. And if you include agnostics, the percentage would probably go way down so that in fact we have no consensus in the scholarly community as to whether there was an empty tomb. Now that's that point. Now there's tons of other things that Dr. Craig has said. Now I don't think, uh, he says that I, I'm just seeing things in the Gospels when I point out all of the things I pointed out to you. I think it would be a remarkable coincidence for all of those literary devices to be in there just by accident or that uh, the, the entire f structure of these stories just happened to correspond to history. For example, Barabbas is actually a very unusual name. It's an odd name. And definitely the fact, even if it wasn't an odd name, the fact that it's in that story and in exactly where it would have that particular meaning of a parallel between two sons of the father in a story that exactly mimics the atonement ceremony of uh, the temple ceremony of the temple Jews that exactly fits the gospel message that Christ is the atoning sacrifice that is uh, dying for the sins of Israel. That, all of that, I mean, that, that to me seems quite plainly to be myth. And all the other examples I gave you are quite plainly myth. And most historians, when they see things like this, they agree. And I listed several biblical scholars who agree with me on this. I mean, he says uh, they don't, but in fact, there were many who do. Now, he also cites the street sermons in Acts. Now, it was actually tradition in ancient historiography to make up speeches. In fact, we have historians who actually tell us we don't really know, we don't have stenographers who are taking these speeches down, so we have to make them up based on what we think the speaker said. The author of Acts, of course, is therefore fabricating these speeches to suit his case, and that's actually very common and commonly accepted in ancient history. We understand this is the case. Now, uh, he mentions that the empty tomb is implied in 1 Corinthians 15, but the fact is Paul doesn't say the tomb was found empty by anyone. He only says that people saw Jesus. And we don't really know what evidence they actually had that the tomb was empty, or even if they believe they did. <clears throat> he also says that women can't serve as witnesses in a Jewish court of law. That's actually completely false. In my uh, book, Not the Impossible Faith, I conclusively demonstrate that they were, in fact, widely accepted as witnesses in Jewish courts, and in Roman courts, and in Greek courts, and that they were even used as sources for historical information. There wasn't anything intrinsically embarrassing about having a woman as a witness. But in fact, the women are not there to provide testimony to the tomb because this is symbolic fiction. The women are there to symbolize something. There are many things they symbolize in this story. I mentioned one, that they are the least who are the first. It exactly represents that. It also fits the fact that Mark builds his empty tomb narrative using exact phrase, using one exact phrase and other concepts from the Jacob's Well narrative in, Gospel, in Genesis where we also have women involved asking the same question, who will move the stone for us? Uh, using the exact same phrase, and also it's a woman speaking. There's many reasons why he would do this. Another reason he would do this is that he's creating more irony from the front to the back of his gospel. Mark has his story end with the implausible remark that the women fled the empty tomb in fear and silence, telling no one anything despite having been told to deliver a message. But this exactly reverses the beginning of Mark's gospel, which speaks of the good news of the voice crying out of the messenger who will, pre who will prepare our way, who was a man, incidentally. So Mark even frames his entire gospel with irony using the women, which means he has to put women here if he's going to create that irony in that story, because the men, of course, saw Jesus and were or preaching Jesus, so they can't have told nothing to no one. So to complete the irony, Mark had to put women in his empty tomb story, Women also fit his gospel lesson that the least shall be first and are easily inspired by his analogy with uh, Jacob's well. Now, he says the empty tomb story is uncolored by theological motifs. I don't think that's relevant. It's not necessary that when Mark is constructing this symbolic myth that he would put any particular motifs in there except the ones he wanted to put in there. He also refers to early Jewish polemic in Matthew. In fact, we have no Jewish sources that refer to this polemic. This is entirely first appears in Matthew. Matthew, uh, it's not even an Acts, which is pretty much to me decisively confirms that the Jews were not accusing Christians of having stolen the body. If they were doing that, the book of Acts would show this as a fundamental component of the story of the early church. The, the Christians would actually have been accused of stealing the body. They would have been brought in in an inquiry. They would have been tried for this crime, even if they were let off. So we don't have any example of the authorities showing any interest in this accusation of theft or making this accusation of theft, even though the Jews brought the Christians in to court many times to try to try them and try to get them uh, convicted of things. This accusation never appears. So Matthew is making this up, and I think he's making it up, as I said, in order to uh, emulate Daniel on the lion's den. It's all a part of his story, and I talk more in Empty Tomb about what the actual motives were 
and what actual message he was creating with that. Um, I won't address the particular arguments that he raised regarding uh, whether Jesus switched bodies. Uh, if you're actually interested in that argument, my Empty Tomb book actually covers it in great detail, uh, and you'll see that some of his arguments don't actually necessarily refute what I'm talking about. My actual argument here today is that we don't actually know what happened to the body or what the original Christians believed about that body. We don't have any reliable evidence for that. The Gospels I don't trust at all, and the Epistles don't talk about the missing body or who actually went to the tomb or if anyone did. Um, all right, what else do we have here that is actually relevant to what I'm talking about? Uh, I gave many examples in the Gospel of Mark of reversal of expectation, so I don't think I'm seeing things there. You can judge for yourselves whether those things represent what I'm talking about. You don't need to take his word for it or any other particular scholar's word for it. And then he asks that he says that radical transformative experience is needed. I'm saying there was one. There was a hallucination exactly like you have other cults when they're facing failure, they have revelations, experiences that tell them how to move on, how to reinterpret what has happened to them. And I'm arguing that this is what happened in this case, and we don't really have any way to disprove that because we don't have any really good evidence as to what was actually going on in the, in the original church. And he argues that no naturalistic theory can explain all the facts. Well, it's not necessary for one particular cause to explain all the facts. If we have multiple causes, that actually happens as well. Very many, many historical events are the result of multiple causes going together. But again, we don't even know if there were multiple causes in this case because we don't know what happened to the body. He also says you can't do psychoanalysis on historical figures. I'm not doing a psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis is a Freudian thing. I'm talking about actual established cognitive science that we know today about schizotypal personalities, about the anthropology of actual religious movements and visionary movements. This is something that we know in our background knowledge is common and typical. And what I'm saying is we should go with what's common and typical until we have evidence confirming the contrary. We don't have adequate evidence to confirm the contrary in this case. Now, I've listed again many scholars, the ones I named, actually agree with me on this idea that the Gospels are myth. So this is not a radical or fringe idea, that there are many, there's a lot of mythology in there. They only debate as to what history you can extract from them. And I'm saying in this case, we can't extract any particular history from them. And I'll stop with that. Let's review those four facts that I said are established by the majority of New Testament scholars today. First, Jesus' burial in the tomb by Joseph of Arimathea. Richard has never disputed that tonight, and yet that is extremely important because the belief in Jesus' resurrection could never have arisen in Jerusalem in the face of an occupied tomb. What about the evidence for the empty tomb? First of all, I mentioned the burial account supports it, and Richard doesn't deny it. Secondly, I said that the empty tomb is multiply attested in early independent sources. Richard asserted that the Passion story was constructed out of Old Testament text, but I showed, in fact, from Qumran, Apocalypticism, and post-biblical historiography that that doesn't happen, that there are many events in the Passion story for which no parallels exist in the Old Testament, and on the other hand, there are obvious things in the Old Testament that weren't picked up in the Passion story. Now, what uh, Richard says here is, well, in Acts, the author simply makes up these speeches. Well, that doesn't work in the case of Acts because Acts is full, filled with non-Lucan Semitisms, traces of early Aramaic speech on the part of the disciples. And this is suggested to a good number of scholars that what we have preserved here are independent traditions that Luke had of the early apostolic sermons and they refer to the empty tomb. So I don't think we've seen any grounds for thinking that the empty tomb is not, in fact, multiply and independently attested, which gives us good grounds for believing in it historically.
I suggested thirdly that the women witnesses lend credibility to the empty tomb story. And here Richard says, oh, but women did serve as witnesses in Jewish courts of law. What he's talking about uh, is uh, passages from the Mishnah, which is 200 years after the time of the gospel events. Moreover, when you look at these passages, what you find out that women can serve as witnesses on is only two things. They can only serve to witness in court to two things. First, they can testify to their virginity when they were married, in case their husband accuses them they weren't a virgin. Secondly, a woman can testify that her husband is dead so that she can prove that she's a widow. That's all they can do. I think that serves to emphasize the point that I'm making, that the testimony of women just wasn't regarded on a par with men's. In any case, what Josephus said probably represented the general prejudice of his time, that women were too lightheaded and brash to uh, serve as credible witnesses. Now, Richard says, but look, Josephus relied on the testimony of women in two cases in his work. Yes, precisely because no male witnesses were available. He's talking about the testimony of women who were the only survivors of the slaughters at Gamala and Masada. And this actually goes to prove my point. This is the only place in the corpus of Josephus where he uses women witnesses. And why does he do so here? Because there were no male witnesses. They were the only survivors of the slaughters. The fact that the women are witnesses shows that Josephus isn't making this up but he is relying on what witnesses he had. And the gospel writers find themselves in exactly the same situation. He says, uh, well, then I mentioned that the uh, gospel accounts of the empty tomb are simple and untouched by legendary or theological embellishment. And he says, yes, they are. Look at the uh, coincidences uh, of the uh, people's names, for example. Well, here I think Richard's uh, speculations just go off the rails. He says that the two Marys at the empty tomb are symbols. Now, understand that one out of every four women at that time was named Mary. This was a very common name. But Richard says that Mary is like Miriam, and she was the sister of Moses, who was the leader of Israel, so Mary is a symbol for Israel, the promised land. And Mary Magdalene, he says, was from Magdala, which is a variant of the word tower, which is transcribed in the Septuagint as Magdalene, which designates the town of Migdal, which represents the borders of Egypt. So she is a symbol of Egypt, which is a symbol of death. Now this is just hermeneutical uh, speculation gone off the rails. It's a good hermeneutical principle that before you try to read the lines, you've got to learn to read the lines. Before you try to read between the lines, you have to learn to read the lines, that is to say. And I don't think Richard has learned to do that yet. He says, well, it serves as irony. It's the reversal of expectations. But as I said, there is no reversal of expectations in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, it fulfills Jesus' predictions. Look at uh, Richard's examples of reversal of expectations. James and John asked to sit at Jesus' right and left hand in glory. Now, what's the reversal of expectation supposed to be? Well, it says Jesus was crucified between two thieves. How is that any great motif of reversal of expectation? This is purely constructed and concocted. I think, as Robert Gundry says, the Gospel of Mark contains no hidden meanings, no sleight of hand, no Christology of irony that means the reverse of what it says. Mark's meaning lies on its surface. And when Richard gets into these symbolical speculations, uh, well, all bets are off. What about the, um, the construction of the event from the uh, Psalms? He says it's constructed from Psalm 24. Well, Psalm 24 is a liturgy that mentions the king's triumphal entry into Jerusalem and the temple. It has nothing to do with tombs, and Mark says nothing about Jesus as king. The only connection with Psalm 24 is the phrase, the first day of the week, and even that isn't identical in Greek. So again, this is just all fanciful in, in Richard's mind. I don't think that there's any uh, persuasive grounds here for thinking that this is uh, a literary creation. Five, the Jewish polemic presupposes the empty tomb. He says this appears only in Matthew. Right, Matthew felt obligated to refute this Jewish rumor. He wouldn't refute the rumor unless it was going around, and that rumor was that the body had been stolen, and that's why it was missing. And I think this goes to support the empty tomb. Uh, 
So I think we've got five good grounds for affirming the historicity of the empty tomb, and that's why, in fact, most scholars do support it. I didn't quote Gary Habermas as my support for that. I quoted Jakob Kramer, who is an Austrian specialist, and you remember said, by far most exegetes support the empty tomb. What about my, uh, or the, the point about Paul's testimony? Let me have Psalm, or Psalm, let me have slide 19, if I may hear. There are uh, three absurd theses that Rither defends that need to be gotten out on the table here with regard to Paul's teaching. The first of these is that the Corinthian error that Paul sought to correct was the belief that because Christ was already a spiritual man, he could rise from the dead while leaving his earthly body in the grave, while we could not. Nobody thinks that this was the Corinthian error. Absurd thesis too, that the resurrection body is identical with what Paul called our inner man, which is growing inside us and will finally come out of the resurrection in an organized form like Casper, the ghost. Those are Richard's words. This absurd interpretation has more in common with the movie Alien than with Pauline thought. Paul nowhere identifies the inner man in Christ with the resurrection body. And the third absurd thesis is that the spiritual resurrection body we have is really part of Christ's resurrection body and therefore of God himself. This turns Paul into a Buddhist who thinks that we return like a drop to the ocean and denies personal immortality in contradiction to Paul. So I think that Richard's exegesis uh, is just fanciful here. He's an admirable bibliographer, but honestly, Richard's just hopeless as an exegete. This is crank exegesis, which no Pauline scholar would accept. Well, I don't think it's crank exegesis at all. And I never use the words Casper the Ghost. I'm assuming that was his uh, commentary on what I have argued. Um, that, that actually isn't any argument I've ever made. Now, um, let's cut to the chase. Now, the main point of contention here, this is one thing that he's conceded, or at least hasn't argued, is that the epistles don't actually mention a missing body. They don't actually tell us what happened that the Christians would believe regarding the empty tomb. We don't know if anyone went there. The epistles don't tell us. All they talk about are visions, and as I established in the, from the epistles, the Christians were regularly hallucinating. So we know from natural science what that probably means as far as where they're getting their information about the resurrection of Jesus, and that they would actually hallucinate Jesus telling them he had been risen from the dead, and from that they would actually believe the tomb is empty, or they would believe that he exchanged bodies. We don't actually know. So let's get to the Gospels. Now, he says, I'm engaging in crank exegesis of the Gospels. Well, I think you can judge that for yourself. I mean, what are the odds of all of the particular coincidences I point out in there? This is not that unusual. He particularly attacks my theory, which I actually didn't present here today, uh, that the three women who come to the tomb are actually symbolic. I actually, the argument is much more elaborate, and the basis of it, which actually makes it plausible, is the implausibility, the improbability of the coincidences that are involved. He just mentions one and he tries to make it sound more uh, ridiculous than it really is, which is that Mary of Magdalene, Mary Ma of Magdala, uh, represents Mary in re association with Migdal. It's actually Magdalene, Magdala is Migdal. It's, it's not an extended argument that I have to get to to make that point. It actually is Mary of Magdala, which is the Migdal, which is the place where we draw the parallels from. But there's also Salome, which is the female name of Solomon, and the other Mary, who is the Mary, the mother of Jacob, which is the Mary, the mother of Israel, and so on. Whether all of this is plausible or not, you can judge for yourself. I argue it in Not the Impossible Faith, where I have a more extended discussion of it than I do in The Empty Tomb. But that's not really the convincing bit to me, actually. That's something that I look for and I, I think is actually plausible after I've already discovered elements of the thing that I find are highly improbable and look like actual symbolic messages, as I've pointed out. This is symbolic fiction. The Cleopas narrative, for example, is a clear case of this. The Barabbas narrative, I think, is a clear case of this. The improbability of these things, as history makes no sense, but as deliberate fiction makes complete sense. Now, Mark's use of the empty tomb narrative. Let me get to that. In 2 Chronicles 16, Mark links Jesus with King Asa, who also famously reformed the Jerusalem cult, by linking the burial to spices, using the same word, and by calling the tomb's doorstone very great, just as the spices burned for Asa's funeral were very great and by introducing the tomb with the same phrase and by calling it hewn from the rock, just as Asa's tomb is called. 
Genesis 29, when the women say who will roll away the stone, Mark copies a phrase from the Genesis narrative of Jacob's fathering of the twelve tribes of Israel, also spoken by a woman, followed by the opening of Jacob's well to bring the water of life to the sheep. Psalm 24 begins with the phrase, on the first from the Sabbaths, a rather strange phrase that we don't find very many times in ancient literature. It means on the first day, but it's worded very strangely. This is the exact same phrase that Mark uses to begin his empty tomb narrative, and yet Psalm 24 is the only passage in the Greek Old Testament that contains this phrase. By choosing this phrase, instead of the more familiar phrase, on the third day, Mark is pointing us to Psalm 24, which speaks of a righteous man receiving salvation from the Lord. In the exact same way, he calls our attention to Psalm 23 for the crucifixion of Jesus, with Jesus' cry on the cross, Lord, Lord, why have you forsaken me? Quoting the exact same Aramaic that comes from the Psalm 23, verbatim. Mark actually follows a three-psalm liturgy in his formation of the death, burial, and empty tomb narratives. He uses Psalm 22 to construct the story of Jesus' crucifixion. That's, Psalm 22 is the one that has the cry on the cross quoted verbatim. Then Psalm 23 aligns with his burial, since it's the well-known funeral psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, etc. Then Psalm 24 speaks of opening the door and the righteous man ascending to the Lord's house, which, marks, turns, which Mark turns into an allusion to opening the tomb and ascending to heaven. I don't think this is implausible at all. I think it's very improbable that you would have all of these conjunction of things. Ecclesiastes 4, in Mark 16, the women journey beneath the sun to anoint their king, Jesus, but find a young man in his place, and as a result, they fail to rejoice. That's Mark's story. In Ecclesiastes, the living walk under the sun with a young man who stands in the place of the king, yet the last people in the story fail to rejoice. The elements are almost identical with similar concepts and wording. I find this very improbable. I'm just telling you how it looks to me. Now, there are many other things I could point out like this. Um, let's talk about the naked boy in Mark. Yeah, did you know there's a naked boy in Mark? Mark mentions an anonymous young man in Greek in Neoniskos exactly twice. At Jesus' arrest, this young boy has his linen garment torn off him, and he runs away naked. Then at the empty tomb, by the way, that's a weird element of the story to add, but it's in there. So why is it in there? That's a good question. At the empty tomb, we see a young boy, exact same word, Neoniskos, appears dressed in white. It is almost certainly meant to be the same boy. The same word is used twice, and only twice, and only those two places, and there's no other reason for, those two, or for the first element to be there except to prepare us for the second. This person is never named, yet twice plays a conspicuous role in the story. Now, linen garments were a common metaphor for the body of flesh. Nakedness was a common metaphor for dying and being naked without a body. Garments of white were a common metaphor for angelic and resurrected bodies. So the young man is thus a symbol of the Christian who will undergo the same sequence, dying, losing their body, becoming naked, and then donning a new superior body at the resurrection. Now, I'm not reading this into the text. It's there. It seems fairly obvious to me that the probability of this is very low of being it there just by accident, and I just am seeing things. Uh, like some sort of psycho on my own. Now the placement of this boy is also significant. Mark says he stands inside the tomb and thus in the land of the dead, on the right, exactly matching a common salvation narrative in pagan mystery cult, in which a white cypress stands to the right in the land of the dead as a marker to the initiate that he was not to stop but to go beyond. Those who go beyond find the water of life, which is called the water of remembrance, while those who stay drink the water of death. So it's not a likely coincidence that this white-clad boy stands on the right inside a tomb called in the Greek a memorial and then asks the woman to remember something they were told and tells them what they're looking for is not there, just as the initiatives told the same, but they must go beyond to find it, it being the very same thing mystery cultists were looking for, eternal life. Hence, Mark closely mimics this mystery narrative in both details and meaning. Now, I want to reiterate, reiterate that had Jesus actually risen from the dead by God, that he could appear to everyone, and he would have if he actually wanted everyone to be saved. It's not enough to say that God has an excuse for not appearing to people. The point is, if he wanted everyone to be saved, the obvious thing for him to do that he could have done is to appear to everyone. The fact that he only appeared to a few people is strange on that theory, but it makes complete sense on the theory that these are just hallucinations by primed believers, and even Paul, as an outsider, was also primed to come to the same conclusion. And... He is alone, actually. There's no other enemies of the church that were converted to join the church. Now, this idea that uh, the Romans would heed crowds' wishes and not release traitors and murderers, his evidence doesn't support that. The particular case he's talking about is not a traitor and not a murderer. There's no evidence that the Romans would ever release such a prisoner, much less, and this is the important point, there's no evidence of this being a custom on the Jewish holiday. That is a particular flag. What custom on the Jewish holiday is Mark talking about? 
Well, the analogy is clear that he's talking about the Yom Kippur. Even though he's not putting this on Yom Kippur, he's clearly talking about the actual ceremony that goes, takes place every year at Yom Kippur, exactly as Mark says, it takes place every year on the holiday. And I showed the analysis of that. Now, he says that what motivated Matthew to include the, uh, the Jewish polemic of the theft, or the, what motivated Matthew to create the guards at the tomb or to create that story was the Jewish accusation of theft. Oh, I can't get to that, so I'm out of time. Thank you. In my closing speech, I'd like to draw together some of the threads of this debate to see if we can come to some conclusions. First of all, I think it's clear that this general consideration that Richard wants to raise about wouldn't Jesus reveal himself to everyone is a philosophical, not a historical consideration that is really out of place in tonight's debate. The point is, theologically, that God will judge people based upon the amount of information they have, and the resurrection of Jesus just has no direct implications for whether you believe in universalism or inclusivism or exclusivism. This is not germane to tonight's debate. What is germane are those four facts that I said are abundantly attested by the evidence. First, you notice that the burial account has never been questioned by Richard tonight. We have good historical grounds for thinking that Joseph of Arimathea buried Jesus in the tomb. With respect to the empty tomb, my first argument for the empty tomb was the accuracy of the burial account supports the fact of the empty tomb, and Richard has never disputed that. Secondly, I argued that it's multiply attested in the pre-Mark and Passion story, in the special sources behind Matthew and Luke, in the independent Gospel of John, in the sermons in the Acts of the Apostle. This explodes Richard's idea that this is merely a literary creation because when you have multiple independent attestation of the same event, it can't be all coincidentally made up by all these people so that it exactly fits together. We have good grounds for uh, thinking that this is, in fact, a historical event. Third, I argued that the women witnesses lend credibility to the narrative, and he didn't respond to that. Fourth, the narrative in Mark is simple and lacks signs of theological embellishment. Here, Richard reiterates that the Markan account is based upon Psalm 22 to 24. I think that holds no weight whatsoever. Remember Psalm 22? It's against literary borrowing because Psalm 22 says, they have pierced my hands and my feet, and yet in the Gospels it never says that Jesus was nailed to the cross, or rather in Mark's pre-Mark and Passion story. Psalm 23 is not about dying. It's about being delivered from death which is the opposite of the crucifixion. And as for Psalm 24, as I already said, it says nothing about tombs, and especially Mark says nothing about Jesus being the king. If he uh, were copying Psalm 24, he would have said something like that. The phrase, the first day of the week, is not identical, contrary to what Richard asserted. It is different in the Greek. So there's simply no grounds for thinking that this is a literary creation based on Psalms 22 to 24. What about the Orphic mystery religions that he brought up in his last speech? Well, Richard gives away his case when he says, and I quote, Mark deliberately left out of his account everything in the Orphic narrative that he rejected and kept in everything that still had direct parallels with the gospel message, and then he changed the details specifically to convey how his message was different from the Orphics. This makes the hypothesis unfalsifiable and vacuous. The only motif that's left is the angel sitting on the right side. But in Judaism, the right side was commonly the favored side. So that shows no sign of literary dependence. Fourth, the Jewish polemic presupposes the empty tomb. Uh, again here, the point is that Matthew is responding to a pre methean tradition that goes right back to the early church in Jerusalem and the disputes with non-Christian Jews. What about the origin of the, uh, or pardon me, what about the uh, uh, appearances Richard doesn't deny those, the origin of the Christian faith. Here he did assert that there was an expectation of a dying Messiah in Daniel, but I want to point out that Daniel 9, 24 to 26 was not understood as a messianic prophecy at this time. Rather, the Jews of Jesus' time would have understood the prince to be Antiochus Epiphanes, and the anointed one slain by him was the high priest Onias III in 175 
uh, BC as narrated in 2 Maccabees. So according to Jimmy Dunn, an eminent Jesus scholar, the most prominent and widespread expression of Messianic hope was of a warrior king who would destroy the enemies of Israel. And yet the disciples came to believe in Jesus' resurrection despite those Messianic uh, expectations to the opposite. Finally, what about the best explanation? Here Richard says, well, most bodies that disappear aren't raised, uh, and therefore it means the resurrection is improbable. Look, all that shows is that the resurrection is improbable relative to our general background evidence, but it doesn't show that it's improbable relative to the evidence of the empty tomb, the post-mortem appearances, and the origin of the Christian faith. Relative to that evidence, I think the resurrection is highly probable, indeed more probable than all of these naturalistic explanations that Richard has attempted to offer tonight. Well, I'll simply ask, what do you consider more improbable? All the amazing coincidences that I pointed out in the Gospels, and mind you, those are only a few. Uh, what's more improbable, that all of those coincidences would just happen to be in there as historical facts, or that they were made up, versus the probability that there would be a miracle, as opposed to, for example, a body going missing for some other reason, or not even being missing, for example. Or, for example, people hallucinating. Now, I've made the case very clearly, I think, that the Christians were prone to hallucination. They did it all the time. So the fact that they see Jesus and say that, I think, supports that. Even if miracles occur, for example, they're very unusual. By far, most missing bodies, again, throughout history are not the result of resurrections. And by far, most appearances of dead people are not resurrections either. That's a fact that Dr. Craig cannot deny and has not denied. Therefore, Craig must prove the evidence for this claim about Jesus is exceptional enough to prove that none of the usual things happened in this case, and I don't think he's done this. All Craig has are the epistles and the gospels, but the epistles give us no evidence of anything unnatural. The only evidence they mention for the claims about Jesus, again, are the visions experienced only by people that the epistles show were hallucinating on a regular basis. And the gospels fabricate stories quite freely. I think I've made that case, despite all his attempts to throw arguments against it. I think you can look and see at the arguments that I've made that it's very clear that these are fabricated stories. They're not showing any evident interest in reporting historical fact rather than creating a symbolic mythology, which entails they're not reliable sources of historical data, and you can't establish a theory on, historical da on, on unreliable data. So I don't think Craig has shown the evidence for this claim about Jesus is exceptional, as he would have to do. Therefore, we can only conclude there was nothing unnatural about the Christian claims about Jesus. If his body went missing, it was most likely the way all bodies go missing. But the epistles don't even say his body went missing, and the Gospels can't be trusted on this point. So we can't even say for sure the body went missing. Now, that's the general point for that. Let's co cover some of the, the general things that he has said about this stuff. He says that multiple attestation, well, what he really means are different versions of the story. That actually doesn't increase historicity. We have different versions of the myths of Hercules. That doesn't make the myths of Hercules any more historical. Obviously, each of the gospel authors is changing the story to suit his own particular interests and needs and ideas and creativity. So the fact that there are multiple different versions of the story does not support that there are any sort of sources behind them that they're using, other than each other, of course. And he said earlier that women can only testify to two things in Jewish law. That's completely false. I mean, as I say, as I conclusively prove in Not the Impossible Faith, that is absolutely false. Uh, the evidence does not support that at all. The evidence actually c clearly confirms that the only evidence we have of hostility to women's testimony solely involves a few minor people making arguments about when women's testimony has to be the same as a man's or could be less than a man's. But in reality, all particular court cases could allow we female testimony. And I show many examples of that show the actual discussions where they say women testifying in court was regular on all subjects. It's not abnormal at all, and it's not only, only those two subjects. Um, he says uh, Daniel was talking about, a, the book of Daniel is talking about a different particular Messiah. Well, I agree, but of course that particular prophecy in Daniel didn't come true. Ironically, Daniel is interpreting a prophecy of Jeremiah that also didn't come true. So he was reinterpreting Jeremiah. When Daniel's prophecy didn't come true, people were trying to reinvent what Daniel said. And so I think what the Christians were saying when they were looking for scriptural passages to understand what had happened to Jesus and try to understand their, their end of the world beliefs, in the light of Jesus' death, they actually reread Daniel and saw the word Messiah in there. The Messiah will be killed. It says that. So they saw that, and that's where they got the idea for this. Now, he, he says that the fact that 
Mark doesn't mention the piercing uh, is relevant. It's not relevant. Mark quotes Psalm 23 verbatim when he's talking about the statements of Jesus. It's not necessary for Mark to use every single element for this to be a marker to his borrowing of certain elements in there. He doesn't have to put every detail in. And we also, we know Jesus is the king. In the previous chapter, he's explicitly called the king, even by the Romans. So it, he doesn't have to repeat it again in his empty tomb narrative. And he says that the phrase used uh, from the first of the Sabbaths in Psalm 24 is different from the use in Mark. It's not relevantly different. It's different in the sense that it's in a different grammatical case that's not relevant to what we're talking about here. It's a clear borrowing adapted to the particular uh, grammatical structure that Mark has. So my, I'll reiterate my final point here is that the Gospels are full of obvious symbolic fiction. I think I've made the case for that you can decide for yourselves. And I'll have a lot more evidence for this in forthcoming books. But if we discount the Gospels as unreliable, all well, we have left are the epistles, and all the epistles show are a bunch of hallucinating cultists, essentially, who saw visions of a resurrected Jesus telling them he had risen from the dead. That's all the evidence we have, and that's not enough to establish that Jesus had actually risen from the dead. Thank you for your patience and your courtesy and your listening and we're going to have a question and answer period now and as I said before, um, if you have a question for Dr. Craig, come over here to this microphone and if you have a question for Dr. Carrier, come over here to this microphone and we will try to alternate these questions back and forth, hopefully. And once again, let's confine ourselves to a question, uh, not take a position, um, because we'll be here way, way too long if we have to listen to everybody's positions and testimony and the like. Okay. And for those of you who don't have a question, just sit back. Yeah, let's start here with a question for Dr. Craig. Is this on? Okay, hi. Uh, I think we have a, ba uh, a war over background evidence. You enter in natural theology and then Dr. Carrier enters in cognitive science in talking about hallucinations. So in this war of background evidence, how exactly do you weigh what takes the weight in terms of what data that we should expect from if God wanted to reveal himself to us? Well, is mine on? Uh, I think hello? Okay. Uh, with respect to the existence of God, if the arguments of natural theology do establish that God exists, then the probability of the resurrection relative to our background information is going to depend crucially on the probability that this God would want to raise Jesus from the dead. Now, it seems to me that given what we know of Jesus' own radical personal claims, um, his claim to be the revelation of God the Father, his miracle working, his exorcisms, and so forth, the skeptic just isn't in a position to say justifiably that it is improbable that God would want to raise Jesus from the dead. And so I don't think that you can say that relative to our background knowledge, it's improbable that God would raise Jesus from the dead. Now, when then you add in all of the evidence that I've suggested, then I think that raises the probability that God rose, raised him from the dead very high. Now, I would want to include all the cognitive science that you mentioned relative to hallucinations. You notice I did not deny that the disciples uh, could have hallucinated. I, I don't know how one would show something like that. But what I argued was that hallucinations cannot explain all of the facts. They can't explain, well, the diversity of the various appearances and that even if they had hallucinated, it wouldn't have led to belief in Jesus' resurrection. So I'm willing to go the mile with the hallucination theory and, and grant, okay, let's grant they had hallucinations. Will that still meet those criteria I laid out? And I think on a number of counts, the hallucination theory fails. If you want to look at this in more detail, look at my book that was mentioned with Gerhard Ludemann. He defends a hallucination theory, and I go into this in great detail in that book as to why I think it doesn't meet these six criteria. <laughs> 
Is it on? Okay. First of all, I want to thank you guys. You guys gave us a free lunch. Um, so, Dr. Carrier, um, I'm, I'm, I want to ask a question, and my assumption is that you assume that the Gospels are basically myth-making. If I'm wrong on that, you can address that too. But I'm curious, since you bring up the issue of, um, um, you know, Simon of Cyrene, and, uh, and the Lazarus issue. How do you explain the fact that Simon, and Sy Simon of Cyrene is stated by Mark to be the father of Rufus and Alexander? Because you only focus on Simon of Cyrene, but in Mark's context, he's talking about Rufus and Alexander as, his, as um, Cyrene, Simon's kids. How does that play into your myth idea? And then the idea of also John, John, John's Lazarus and Luke's Lazarus, Luke gives it as a parable, and John gives him as a historical person in Bethany. How, how do you, I mean, I don't see the, the correlation between those two. Yeah, I'll take the last one first. Um, as I was arguing, John is actually inventing the historical Lazarus using the fictional character, and in doing that is commenting on Luke's use of the parable. And one reason we can be we can conclude this is the fact that this Lazarus character doesn't appear in any of the other Gospels. Here we have in the last Gospel of John, we've never heard of a historical Lazarus, despite the fact that Jesus supposedly rose him from the dead, despite the fact that he was supposedly beloved by Jesus, despite the fact that he was supposedly at the empty tomb, despite the fact that he supposedly saw Jesus and, and so on, and actually witnessed the crucifixion and all this. All of these things first get mentioned in John. We've never heard of them before. None of the other Gospels say this. So I think that in and of itself is a big red flag that we're looking at someone who, whom John is making up. And then when we see where he's getting the idea and how it makes sense that his creation of this Lazarus character is a commentary on Luke, we fully understand now what he's doing in, in creating this Lazarus character. With regard to Simon of Cyrene, now there's a lot of cases where I believe there's symbolism in the Gospels where we don't have the sufficient background evidence to know exactly what's going on. So we have to be more speculative in some cases than in others. For example, we know there are a lot of, uh, we know there are much more elaborate stories about Romulus, for, for instance, about his uh, incarnation, death, and resurrection uh, that we don't have. So there's a lot of times where the gospel authors could be commenting on things, texts, and so forth that we no longer have. So we can't necessarily be sure of the reconstructions. We can only catch the ones that are obvious, like the Barabbas narrative, the Cleopas narrative, uh, the Lazarus narrative. I think those are cases where we have enough information to actually confirm uh, the case. And so we created a basically a prior probability, once you have enough of these cases, the prior probability that any other story in the Gospels is also symbolism is very high. And so I think that that in and of itself warrants further license in trying to figure out what the symbolism might be. Now Simon of Cyrene is, is I think, a significant case of this, where I can tell you what I think Mark was doing, but I don't, we don't have the documents to know for sure because they're lost to us. We, we don't have a lot of the documentation from the ancient world. So I can only give you a hypothesis that, that's unprovable in my view. But then, so again, is the other hypothesis that he was an actual man with sons. We can't prove that hypothesis either. We don't have any particular evidence for it, despite uh, certain archaeological finds that are, actually aren't statistically determinative of whether it was the actual uh, Simon of Cyrene that we're talking about. But um, my speculation is, my hypothesis would be that, first of all, Simon is from Cyrene, which is the land beyond Egypt. It's on the other side of Egypt. So he's gone from the other side of Egypt all the way over to Jerusalem. Egypt was a common symbol of death. So in a sense, he's representing the way of death. And his, by being the father of two particularly famous people in the ancient world, Alexander the Great and Rufus, uh, Musonius Rufus. Musonius Rufus was in the Roman period regarded as the second Socrates, and he had many moral teachings that were very similar to Jesus's. Uh, so in a sense, the commentary is that the way of Stoicism that Musonius Rufus represented is not the correct way, not the correct path, uh, to salvation. And the way of Alexander the Great, of seeking glory and conquest, is also not the way of salvation. And then what we have here is Simon of Cyrene, maybe the son of, or maybe the father of these things, but by picking up the cross of Jesus, he is actually representing the path to death that Jesus is going through. But of course, Jesus is going to represent salvation for those who actually accept his atoning sacrifice. Now, that's pure speculation, I agree. I mean, uh, there's no way I can prove this or anything. It's the other cases that I presented here today and a few others that I think I can prove because the evidence is fairly clear. So all I can do is give you speculation like I did about that. And that's what I think. If it's not that, then I do think it's symbolism in some other respect that is lost to us because we don't have the documents. Okay, let's um, go back over here for a question for Dr. Okay. Craig. Dr. Lane, uh, 
Dr. Carrier, uh, central ex explanation for appearances was hallucinations. Given that hallucinations uh, in psychoanalysts are held as individual events, how would you refute the fact that obviously we've had multiple individuals have the same hallucination? And wouldn't that be like me having a dream, going up to my friends in the morning and say, wow, what a dream we had last night. Let's pick it up tonight. <laughs> well, in one sense, you're right, because since hallucinations are projections of a person's own mind, uh, they cannot be literally shared because they are intra-mental. However, there are group hallucinations in the sense that there can be groups of people who imagine that they are seeing the same thing at the same time, and these are, are documented. So you can't rule it out absolutely, but I do think that what you have in the case of the Gospels is you have such diversity that it breaks all parallels in the psychological case books. The appearances appear not just to one person, but to many individuals, not just to individuals, but to groups of people not just under one location and one set of circumstances, but at multiple locales and under a variety of circumstances, not just to believers, but also to unbelievers as well. Uh, and this kind of diversity simply can't be accommodated by the psych uh, psychological theory of hallucinations. I think it renders it uh, quite improbable, uh, along with all of the other uh, arguments against hallucinations that I mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carrier and Dr. Craig, for coming to Northwest. Dr. Carrier, with your hallucination theory, I was wondering if you can back up the hallucination theory by stating uh, in today's science what the DSM-4 says about hallucinations and the criteria as to how we can conclude that Paul and others, based on what the DSM-4 says about grief hallucinations, um, that they had those hallucinations? Well, the DSM-4 is actually a diagnostic manual for determining mental illness. Um, I'm not actually proposing that Christians were mentally ill, so I don't think that's relevant here. Um, what's relevant are the definitions of hallucination in cognitive science and in anthropology and sociology, for example, and the studies of religions, for example, the Shaker cults and the Santero cults and the Cargo cults, and various other examples of religious groups, even mass groups, uh, having hallucinations. Of course, they would be convincing themselves that um, they were having uh, common hallucinations, even when literally they, they, they weren't. Um, I'm not exactly sure what you are looking for, though, in terms of definition of... Well, what I heard you say was by today, based on today's science, we can know that they had hallucinations. Uh, and so the, the, basically the psychiatric encyclopedia okay. to be able to tell is the DSM-4. The DSM-5 is coming out, but the DSM-4 yeah. is, is... Well, I, I, I mean, you're, you're focused on a diagnostic manual yeah. for, for mental mm -hmm. illness, and that, that's, not, that's not relevant to here. Uh -huh. um, if you're looking for studies of hallucination in religious contexts, mm -hmm. uh, I give several examples citing it uh, in the scholarship in uh, The Empty Tomb, where I have a section where I'm talking about hallucination in uh, my spiritual body chapter. Uh, I have sources cited there, a lot of them that are worth reading on this subject. Uh, I think I also revisited in Not the Impossible Faith. Um, if you're looking for that, that's what you're looking for there in terms of that. Where we have, in many cases, actually through brain scans as well, confirmed that people can hallucinate through natural means. And that it's actually common. I mean, one example is the hypnagogic and hippopompic hallucinations, which have been studied extensively in science. If you look in uh, science journals and so forth, look for hypnopompic, hypnopompic hallucination or hypnagogic hallucination you'll see many examples of how even normal people can hallucinate. Um, so this is, the, if you're looking for a kind of definition of what hallucination is, how we understand it's physiologically produced, uh, and the fact that these things don't, aren't real. I mean, if you're, if you're being, you know, killed by a succubus in, in a hallucination, um, I, I don't think there's anyone in this room that would believe that that's actually happening. And there's a lot of cases where we have religious people seeing things, seeing things in the skies, meeting people that don't exist, talking to gods and so forth, uh, that span huge numbers of traditions. And so they can't all be true. So in fact, even if any of them are true, the probability that are that one we're focusing on, like Christianity, that these are the true visions and all the others are hallucinations, 
the probability of that is low, so you would need very strong evidence confirming that the Christian case was exceptional, and we don't have very strong evidence that the Christian case was exceptional compared to all other religions and other hallucinatory contexts. Thank you. And uh, just a real quick question. Can you both please define ad hoc? Because I, I forgot my Webster tonight, so. <laughs> it means contrived or artificial. It, it means, yeah, it means, means made up out of whole cloth or, or yeah, with, it, not in basis of evidence, I suppose you'd say. Thank you. Over here. Since you're uh, both a theologian and a historian, I'm going to address you as both with this question. All right. Um, in all non-theological history regarding Caesar, Washington, whatever, we take documents that we allow, f which we allow could be fallible, not correct in every area. And we take them, and from them, using our best discernment, we ascertain to the best of our ability what probably or what did happen. So with regard to um, the four Gospels, how necessary is it to treat the four Gospels as infallible and inerrant, especially when um, they do have several, and I'm going to use the word apparent, um, apparent contradictions such as Judas' death. Judas' death is not the point, by the way. Um, I'm not saying it contradicts, I'm just saying, sure. yeah. Um, but it appears to, at the very least. How important is it for us to believe that these four documents are infallible and to what extent does that belief affect our ability to historically assess them? It plays no role at all in the argument that I presented tonight. Um, we're treating the Gospels as ordinary historical documents, not as inspired or in holy or, in or infallible books. Um, as Richard himself acknowledges, uh, even uh, writings that uh, are filled with errors uh, lies, contradictions, and so forth can have historical nuggets in them that the historian can mine uh, for valuable knowledge of the past. So, for example, take the apocryphal gospels, these forged gospels that came hundreds of years after the, the death of Jesus. Even though these are filled with fabulous legends and stories, nevertheless, there are historical nuggets in them that can be uh, extracted and can be found when you apply to them the criteria for authenticity. So the thing about the argument that I presented tonight is that it's not based in any way on presupposing that the Gospels are inspired or infallible or anything of that sort, but that we just approach them using the ordinary canons of historical scholarship that we would use for investigating other documents of ancient history. And what emerges from this study is, as I say remarkably, is that facts like the crucifixion, the burial of Jesus, the discovery of his empty tomb, these post-mortem appearances, and the origin of the disciples' belief in his resurrection can be well established as belonging to the historical core of what we know about this man, Jesus of Nazareth. Okay. Thanks. Over here. All right. Can you hear me? All right. Uh, Thank you guys, for, again, for coming out. I know you've probably been thanked many of times. But uh, my question is for Dr. Carrier. Um, in your first argument, uh, you uh, outlined the whole concept of Barabbas. And um, based on the uncommon name, what you said, it was an uncommon for a man to be named uh, Barabbas during that time. Uh, based on an uncommon name, how can you say he never existed? Uh, my mother has a very uncommon name, yet she exists. Uh, <laughs> and so... <laughs> And you said uh, one means son of the father as well as the other. Uh, as Dr. Craig said, uh, as I study my Bible, I'm very much of a Christian. Uh, I try to keep the Bible in its proper context when reading the word so I can see the point of view uh, that the author originally intended. And uh, so what if one name could probably mean son of just an earthly father, you know, son of the biological father, while Jesus Christ obviously means son of God, the heavenly father. Uh, so just basically what do you have to say to that? Well, if it meant son of the biological father, that would still be a fake name. Um, but I want to address your first question, uh, because no, no one names their kid son of the father in that, in that sense. But um, the point about the uncommon name, 
Merely being an uncommon name, I completely agree with you, that would not be sufficient evidence for someone's non-existence, not at all. And I, I would not make that argument, and I didn't make that argument. Uh, it's the conjunction of all of the coincidences with the conjunction of the implausibilities of the historical story being told. So when, when we look at the entire context of the Barabbas narrative where it exactly matches the Yom Kippur annual ceremony in a story about an annual ceremony that otherwise we have no evidence existing and probably didn't exist because it, it's not something the Romans would do, uh, and that it exactly matches the story of the gospel where we have the one person being granted the sins of Israel, murder and insurrection, and then one person dying for the sins of Israel, exactly like the goats in the ceremony. And then what you see is this key word, Barabbas, son of the father, exactly paralleling Jesus as the son of the father. The, when you see the conjunction of all of these things, I think it's beyond any doubt mm. that we're looking at symbolic fiction, the same way that other myths, the pagan myths, were written in the same way, where they would use, tell stories like this. We have biographies of Romulus, for example, where we have stories like this that are constructed symbolically. So that, it's, it's the conjunction of all the evidence that can come to the conclusion, not, not the unusual name at all. Thank you. Another question from over here? Uh, yes, Dr. Craig. I would like to first ask, as a setup, uh, was the audience of Matthew Jewish and was its author uh, Jewish? You're asking me? Yes. Whether, um, it seems to be that that would be a, a Jewish gospel, emphasizing Jesus as king, for example, yeah. Then uh, why in uh, the story of the guards does it say, uh, it, this is verse 15 of the last chapter of Matthew, and they, having received the money, did as they were taught, and the account was spread abroad amongst Jews until this day. Uh -huh. And why is it that if it says specifically until this day, indicating a long time for this uh, with a nebulous beginning in the past yeah. is this absolutely stated as proof that there is a uh, empty tomb that needed to be explained since it could have just popped up later yeah. uh, when the Jews just wanted to, uh, the Orthodox Jews just wanted to get rid of the, the yeah. Christian sect. Well now, if you mean that a Jew could not have referred to his fellow Jews by saying that this has been spread among Jews until this day, that's not a good argument because John gospel is very Jewish and yet it polemicizes all the time against the Jews so it, its target was Gentiles uh, I think well but I mean it's a Jewish it's a Jewish gospel and so I don't and and I don't see why Matthew couldn't use that expression to say this has been spread among Jews until this day and what you have in Matthew I think that's so interesting is you have as you say the tail end of what looks to be a very long controversy the original proclamation of the disciples in Jerusalem was probably, he is risen from the dead. Now, what did the Jewish uh, leadership respond to that? The response was to say, the disciples stole away his body. Then the Christian response to that was, no, the guard would have prevented any such theft. To which the Jewish response then was, well, the guard fell asleep. And then the Christian response to that was, no, the Jewish leadership bribed the guard to say this. So what you see here is the tail end of a long controversy that goes back to, I think, the earliest days in Jerusalem of Jewish Christians and uh, non-Christians uh, interacting with each other over what happened to the body of Jesus. And the non methean vocabulary that's in this narrative would just be confirmatory of that long tradition that I think suggests that we have good grounds here for thinking this is not a late tradition, but rather a very early tradition that uh, supports the historicity of the empty tomb. Thank you. Go to the side. Hi. Um, you said that there isn't enough sufficient evidence, however you follow by saying, by showing that there was histor historical evidence as well as evidence of eyewitness testimonies. You then said that you don't believe the Gospels because they're mythological and the epistles then speak of Jesus rising from the dead. Um, it seems that there is sufficient evidence. You just don't believe it to be so. Ironically enough, you said that we can read your books to be informed about the topic. So what exactly is sufficient evidence to you? Uh, you mean what hypothetically would have been sufficient evidence? Yeah, like what do you think is sufficient, sufficient yeah, evidence? Yeah, I mean, there, there are probably a hundred examples I could give that would all be sufficient for me. I'll just give you one uh, example for that. Uh, if Jesus had risen from the dead and appeared to everyone in the world so that we had simultaneous documentation in China, India, 
Babylon, Rome, and so forth, that he actually did this, which we would have. I mean, if we had, for example, Mark says the whole world was covered in darkness. Had that actually happened for three hours uh, during uh, you know, a new moon, for example, this would be widely documented by astronomers and historians throughout the world, and we would be able to corroborate it from independent traditions, and we could actually confirm, regardless of what we believe the cause of that darkness was, we could actually confirm historically that it had occurred, whatever its explanation was. The same thing could have happened for the resurrection of Jesus if he'd appeared to people and explained, you know, I, I, this is who I am, I have risen from the dead, here is my message to you. And we had this independently corroborated the wor worldwide, even especially in cultures where you wouldn't expect this to occur. That, to me, would, con would convince me that something had happened, that, that this Jesus character had risen from the dead in some sense, whatever I then concluded the cause of that was. I would find that sufficient historical evidence, at least of the fact, regardless of, of the theology behind it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Craig. Uh, thanks again for your presentation. And my question is going to play off of Dr. Carrier's response over there. Um, he, he keeps hitting at this point that Jesus appearing to the whole world, you know, if he really resurrected from the dead. First of all, you're a Christian. Has Jesus appeared to you? No. Okay. Now, what do you, how do you respond to that statement that Jesus has to appear to everyone? And secondly, what relevance does that have to do with the discussion of the historicity of the resurrection? Well, it, it has no relevance, and it's really surprising to see this philosophical intrusion into what's supposed to be a historical discussion. A person could be a universalist. He could think that uh, everyone is going to be saved, whether he believes in Jesus Christ or not, that uh, the uh, benefits of Christ's atoning death are applied to every person in the world. Uh, whether you're a universalist, an inclusivist, an exclusivist, just has nothing to do with the historicity of the resurrection. That has to do with your theology. Um, I'm of the persuasion that God does want all persons to be saved, to come to a knowledge of himself, and therefore that he orders the world in such a way that he places people at times and places in history where he knows that they will have opportunity to come to him and uh, to believe in him and to be saved, and that there will be no one who will be lost because of the accidents of history or geography. That anybody who wants to be saved or even would want to be saved will be born at a time and place in history where he has adequate evidence and opportunity to be saved. Um, now that's a theological conviction and it's unrelated to the historicity of the empty tomb and things of that sort. So this just shouldn't play any role in the uh, debate tonight, this is a question for theology or philosophy, not for the historicity of the Gospels. Thank you. Um, quickly, uh, my question has two parts. First part being, would you agree that um, when you are writing a document or a debate that citing multiple types of sources is um, is, you know, is really important to the authenticity of a document in and of itself. And the second question being um, partly a statement, partly a question. You, you said in your first, in multiple rebuttals throughout your debate towards Dr. Craig that there were numerous scholars that did not believe in the empty tomb and other such um, statements that Dr. Craig made. How come you did not state multiple, why did you not make multiple sites towards those statements and most of your sightings being from your own books when the mark of a good writer or debater is to make multiple sites supporting his theory, none of which are his own? Okay, uh, I'll take the second question. I'll need to ask you about the first one because I didn't understand it. Uh, the second question, I cited that article by Gary Habermas in the Journal for the Study of the Historical Jesus, June 2005. He actually identifies 13 uh, scholars who, by name, actually don't believe in the resurrection, or argue against the empty tomb. Um, I personally have spoken to a large number of scholars who have expressed to me their agnosticism on the point, and Habermas didn't even look for agnostics or, mm -hmm. or account them. Uh, so even just as a matter of statistical fact, according to Habermas's data, we're looking at at least a quarter of all scholars that, that have specifically argued on this subject have taken the position that I'm, that, well, that I have taken in, in, in the past and in this case as a possible position. But um, 
so, so already he's talking about you know, 13 or 14 of them. Uh, if you were to add the agnostics in, because he's only measuring the pros and the cons, if you add the agnostics into the equation, the percentage goes up. It, goes, it has to, I mean, mathematically necessarily, it has to go above a quarter. Uh, so if you assume that there's a quarter also are agnostics, which I think is a more than reasonable assumption, we're looking at a 50-50 split. Now Habermas's database was also based on, he, he didn't single out actual qualified experts in ancient documents and history, he counted everybody. So he included philosophers, for example, who didn't have any specific skills in this particular area. Mm -hmm. um, if you exclude them and only look at qualified experts, the data might, the, I mean, the percentages might change even again. Uh, and then, of course, another point I would like to make is that I didn't have time to in the debate, which is that uh, Habermas makes the point that most of those who argue for the empty tomb do so on the basis that they believe that women's testimony wasn't accepted in the ancient world. So most of those people who are in that 75% of the ones that he counted are actually using an uninformed conclusion on that point. So I think once you eliminate that, then the percentage goes way above 50%. Now we're, now we're flipping the odds in the other direction, really, because then you might have changing a lot of minds in that case. Um, why I didn't cite them, I, I, you know, just, I, I could have. I just mentioned the Habermas article as the sort of sweeping example of that. Um, now that's the second question. With regard to the first question, I didn't understand it. Could you maybe re-explain? Um, basically, it, it or was... was that just um, a prelude to the second question? It was a prelude, uh, uh, like a segue into the yeah, second yeah. question. Yeah, um, yeah. Interpreting your first question in light of your second question, uh, what you're talking about is naming actual scholars who advocate a position currently right now. Mm -hmm. um, in that respect, uh, I think one has to take into account do you trust the biases in that particular area, and does the scholar have the relevant experience, and has he looked at the relevant evidence, and is he basing his conclusion on the correct arguments? Um, and that's, I've just explained that to you as to, with regard to the Habermas example of his database of these scholars at this point, um, where you have to approach that issue critically. Um, so I, I don't know if that answered your question, but... I, uh, in part, yes. Okay, I hope you know, all right. <laughs> um. You used as two of your five uh, facts or pieces of evidence um, supporting, supporting your case, um, Joseph of Arimathea and the testimony of women. Yes. Um, you said that their historical unlikeliness um, makes, it, makes your case more, or sub give, gives credit to your case. Um, I would argue that uh, their unlikeliness um, actually serves better to um, support uh, Mark's message, the Christian message, that they're um, more likely put in there to show Christians reading the Gospels and, and um, people hearing the epistles and, and everything, uh, that Christians should be inclusive, that, you know, not all Jews, like Joseph of Arimathea, not all Jews are uh, Christ killers and not all women are... are uh, crazy, and, yeah. and that. Oh, uh, so how do you respond to that? Yeah, well, um. I think you're reading, <laughs> I, I think you're reading 21st century Western political correctness into the Gospels, trying to show that they're so inclusivistic and everything, and I think that's utterly foreign to their concerns. With respect to Joseph of Arimathea, remember his existence uh, is multiply and independently attested as well as being highly unusual um, in the sense that the Christians would hardly invent somebody who's a Sanhedrist, all of whom Mark says condemned Jesus, who then does what's right by Jesus in giving him a burial in, in the tomb. So uh, given this, it's a cumulative case. It's not based on any single fact. It's the cumulative force of all of these, I think, that suggests to the vast majority of scholars that the burial narrative is historical. And with respect to the women witnesses, uh, again, there's, it, it's incontrovertible that the testimony of women was not as highly prized in first century Judaism as the testimony of, women, uh, of men. And so a late legendary account would in all probability make men discover the empty tomb because any conceivable role played by women would be more aptly played by men and give more credible testimony. I think the reason that women are the discoverers of the empty tomb is very much like those Josephine examples. That was the only witnesses there were. These were the ones they had. These were the ones who really did it. 
and therefore the Gospels faithfully record it. Thank you. Okay. Um, Dr. Carrier, uh, the naturalistic explanation you gave for the post-mortem appearance of Christ to people is that of mass hallucinations. Um, some quotes by you tonight are, the Christians were regularly hallucinating, uh, Christians were prone to hallucinating, they did it all the time, and other cults facing failure with no other way to move on also relied on this. Uh, you failed to address the fact that Paul, who is not a member of this alleged cult, uh, had one of these, quote, hallucinations uh, while he was actually on his way to arrest some Christians. And you didn't address the fact that his life was radically different afterwards, um, how he was hunted, nearly arrested, had to escape uh, imminent death in multiple situations, and he ultimately did die in a cell proclaiming the word of Christ. Uh, as a man who probably would consider himself logical, how could you say that uh, his life after this, quote, hallucination um, could be possibly attributed to nothing other than the transformative powers of God and merely to a hallucination? Well, I, I think Paul genuinely believed. <laughs> Paul genuinely believed what he saw. I don't, I don't think Paul thought it was a hallucination, obviously. When he hallucinated Jesus communicating to him the gospel, he actually believed this was really the case. So obviously it would transform his life in all the ways that you described because he actually thought that had actually happened. He believed it. Um, the question is, why would Paul have that hallucination? Uh, I advance particular theories in the empty tomb as to why that might be, but I think the more important point is that why only Paul, of all the persecutors of the church? Why none of the leader, leading persecutors of the church? Why no other persecutors of the church? Why was it just one guy? And I think the reason being is that precisely because it's unusual, it would be uncommon, let's say, statistically uh, a low frequency of particular persecutors coming to realize, for example, that they actually agree with the Christian message, their moral message, for example, and start to feel guilt, for example, about uh, persecuting the church. You can come up with explanations like that as a particular psychological reasons why. You can come up with several. We don't know enough information about what Paul actually was thinking at the time to actually know. Uh, so the question really is, statistically, what's going to be the case? Statistically, if there's going to be any psychological explanation for Paul to suddenly have this revelation to himself and convince himself that the Christians are right and that <coughs> Jesus is actually, uh, actually was rose, risen from the dead and so forth, uh, whatever explanation that might be, it's going to be uncommon. And the fact that Paul is extremely uncommon, he in fact <coughs> is unique, there's only one persecutor of the church that this happened to, I think that confirms the prediction of my theory that what we're looking at are unique psychological conditions that actually inspired Paul to have this hallucination. And the fact that Paul is alone confirms that prediction. Uh, whereas, if you take the theory, and, and against Craig, what he was saying earlier, that I do think the issue of whether Jesus would appear to all people is historically relevant. It's not a theological point. I'm not talking philosophy here. I'm talking about what predictions do, do his theory make that are different from the predictions that my theory make. Now, if his theory predicts that Jesus is just going to appear in exactly the same place and way and manner that natural theories would also predict, then there isn't any way to tell the difference between natural explanations of the facts and his explanation of the facts. And consequently, we can't decide between them and we can't claim his theory is known. His theory has to make predictions that are different from the predictions made by the naturalistic theories. And those predictions have to come true, whereas the naturalistic predictions have to come false. And that doesn't come to, to the fore here. And we, we have a situation with Paul where I think is a classic example of that. The fact that Jesus only appeared to one outsider confirms the naturalistic expl explanation because that's exactly what naturalism predicts. Whereas the fact that Jesus didn't appear, we, we, if Jesus could have appeared, let's put it that way, Jesus could have appeared to everyone on earth, and as I mentioned earlier, had he done so, I would probably be convinced by the evidence of it because there would be a tremendous amount of evidence confirming this thing that would have no other naturalistic explanation in my view, or at least no easy naturalistic explanation. So that's what I'm talking about when I say Jesus could appear to everyone. I'm not saying Jesus had to appear to everyone or they necessarily would have, I'm saying that that's the kind of thing that you would expect for that particular kind of theory. Jesus wants people to have this message. Obviously, if I wanted people to have a particular message that's going to transform their life, make their lives better, and I had the means to appear to everyone and give them a short discussion of this and give them some sort of evidence that this is really the thing they should follow, I would do so. But obviously, I can't be more compassionate or more intelligent than God. So if God also had the same desire and that means he would have done so. So I say this is a prediction of Craig's theory that is actually falsified by the historical evidence. And that's the position I take with regard to your question and, and its relation to other topics like that. Thanks. Uh, okay. We have time to take one more from each side, I think, and that'll probably be it. 
Okay, so my question actually kind of goes off of what Dr. Carrier just said. And he mentioned earlier today and in a previous debate between the two of you that if the God of the universe truly wanted everyone to be saved, that Jesus Christ should have appeared to everyone and not just to the people who did. Um, so going off of that argument, and I feel like you didn't adequately answer it, but um, could you just give us some more references or some more explanations as to either why Jesus Christ only appeared to the few, why he didn't appear to everyone, or both? Yes, I'm glad to address that topic. Um, I don't think that we can know with any probability at all that if Jesus was genuinely divine and risen from the dead, that he would appear to everybody on earth. Why think that? The only reason is if you think that somehow appearing on earth would win the salvation of more people than not doing so. But suppose you're a universalist. Suppose you believe that everybody is saved, uh, regardless of their response to Christ. Then there's no probability that if Christ is risen from the dead, he would appear to everybody on earth. Suppose instead you take my view, which is what I call a middle knowledge perspective. On a middle knowledge perspective, God knows exactly what sort of evidence would uh, elicit the affirmative response of people in various circumstances. And he can providentially order the world so that anyone who would freely embrace God and his salvation is born at a time and place in history where he does hear the message of the gospel and is given sufficient evidence. On that kind of middle knowledge perspective, there's no probability at all that Jesus Christ would appear to everybody in the world. Maybe what Richard doesn't appreciate is that God doesn't simply want people to believe that he exists or that Jesus is risen from the dead. That's really a sort of matter of relative indifference according to the Bible to God. What God really wants is for people to enter into a love relationship with him, to come to know him and his, his love. And if God, as Richard has said in his writings, wrote in the moon, Jesus lives, or he arranged the stars so that they spelled out Jesus lives in the heavens. Well, more people might come to believe that Jesus is risen from the dead, but there's no guarantee at all that that would lead more people into a saving love relationship with him. Indeed, I could well imagine that in such a world, after a while, people would begin to chafe under such brazen advertisements of the creator and uh, resent his effrontery for such uh, blazon, or brazen uh, advertisements of his existence. Uh, I think that God, endowed with middle knowledge and with the witness of his Holy Spirit, knows exactly the circumstances and the people to create in the world and at the various times and places in history in such a way as to bring the optimal number of people freely to himself. And so given that theological con conviction, there's no probability at all that Jesus would appear to everybody on earth. The purpose of the appearances in the, go in, the, in the Gospels, to repeat, was not to convince people in general Jesus was risen from the dead. It was to commission the disciples to the task of world evangelization. And that task has been carried out remarkably well. Christianity is the hugest, most successful movement in the history of mankind, which is continuing to change lives and to spread uh, with uh, rapidity all across the face of the globe. And uh, I think that we're simply not in a position to gainsay God's wisdom in the way in which he has chosen to have this message brought to, uh, to mankind. So I, I guess I just don't see any probability that if God exists and he raised Jesus from the dead, that Jesus would appear to every single person in the world. Thank you. Last question over here. All right, I'm happy to be the last question. Thanks. Uh, this is for Dr. Carrier and Dr. Craig. I think you'll both enjoy this question a little bit. Um, this is assuming Christianity um, could be a myth, and also that myth could become history. Um, how many people in here have a TV? <laughs> okay, um, you know, I'm in, I'm in college and stuff. Um, I took this class called Theories of Mass Communication. We learned about, learned about this thing called the social construct theory. 
Uh, talks about how people shape their realities off of symbology uh, found in, you know, like media, propaganda. Uh, this can be like music over images. It's called transfer method, card stacking, you know, taking certain uh, information and hiding the rest. Uh, there are tons of ways to do this. Um, so our lessons are learned by fiction, you know, Shakespeare, our stories of love, like what that is. Um, they can lead to jealousy, envy, temporary inspiration. They're usually like dead end. Um, endings. Um, and I'm going to ask a question, I promise. I hope so. <laughs> well, I got to... Okay, um, so with these many myths shaping our history, um, we pursue stories in a pseudo-schizophrenic kind of way, creating our realities. Um, this gets more frightening in an age where media consumes our uh, society, like especially American society. Um, and of course, awareness of, all, uh, awareness of all these myths, they can allow us to be more empirical. They can allow us, you know, to uh, be in truth, be free. Um, and assuming Jesus is a myth, um, this could be a myth that frees us from other myths, um, brings us into truth, uh, intervention in literal history. So the question is... <laughs> The last book before Revelations is Jude. It warns that people will stop um, believing in Christ. Um, if that happens, will society be overconsumed in media in a pyramid power type fashion, top down? <laughs> um, well, of course, that involves futuristic speculation well beyond the topic of the debate today. Um, Postmoderns. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm, I, so I won't give it a really elaborate response. I mean, my, my answer basically is no, I don't think that's the case. <laughs> Good one. I take that back. We're going to take another question or two more questions from people that came all the way from Omaha. So step up to the mic. Is that, oh, is it on this? Oh, okay. Uh, my question is, uh, Dr. Craig, it's gone back and forth a couple times. Uh, one of your primary arguments is multiple independent attestation. I'm assuming that the cumulative uh, weight adds to the, to the argument. Uh, I believe Dr. Carrier said it's not multiple, it's not independent, it's all a bunch of people feeding off of the same story. Can you elaborate a little bit on what multiple yeah. independent is? One of the most important criteria of authenticity that historical Jesus scholars use would be to have independent descriptions of the same event that um, are early because it's highly improbable that two people would independently make up the same story. So if you can find a saying or an event in the life of Jesus that is attested in independent and early sources that increases the probability that it goes back to the historical Jesus. And as I say, usually scholars are delighted to find two such independent and early sources. But in the case of the burial and the empty tomb, we have five or six such very, very early sources which are independent. These include things like the pre-Mark and Passion story and the pre-Pauline tradition that is quoted in 1 Corinthians 15, which goes back to it just a, in a few years of the events. So one of the weaknesses, I think, of Richard's uh, analysis historically of Jesus and his story is that Richard isn't sufficiently working with the sources behind the Gospels. He, he just treats Matthew and Luke as dependent upon Mark. He thinks that Mark is the only source of the other Gospels. I gather he thinks that John is not independent of the synoptics, whereas I think he needs to come to grips with the fact that these authors are working with earlier sources that are not all dependent upon Mark. And so we have uh, independent and early attestation to these events, and that increases the probability that we're getting here, as I say, back to historical pay dirt. Is that essentially how you're ruling out collusion? It, ruling out what? Collusion, collusion on their right, part? Right, yeah, that would, collusion would be, uh, if, if 
if, for example, Matthew and Luke's only source for the passion story were Mark, then in that sense, the witness of Matthew and Luke wouldn't count as anything additional to Mark. But what scholars have been able to show is that there are special sources behind Matthew and Luke, usually called M and L for obvious reasons, which contain information that they didn't get from Mark and can't be explained as just editorial additions to Mark made by Matthew and Luke. And as I say, John is generally regarded as independent of the synoptics. So you've got good grounds here for thinking that this isn't, as you put it, the result of collusion or just literary copying or literary dependence. Is this our, is this our last question? Okay. Thank you very much for, for taking the question, and thank you both to Dr. Craig and, and Dr. Carrier. Uh, Dr. Carrier, in your, in your comments about the, the Gospels being myth and uh, the amount of, of uh, literary devices that are included in those, uh, it seems that you give the four Gospel writers who are from very diverse occupations, uh, one of whom is a fisherman, and an incredible and, in my mind, implausible amount of knowledge of very intricate literary devices that only very scholarly and learned individuals would have, uh, would have had access to. Um, given the fact that in, in Acts, even the Jewish leaders take note that John is an unschooled man, uh, would you respond to uh, the question of how four diverse writers uh, would have this incredible amount of, of intricate literary knowledge to get the point across to create a myth? Um, well, first of all, Acts doesn't say that John wrote our John. Uh, in fact, we, and we don't know that any of the authors of the epistles, or I mean, the gospels, were fishermen. We don't have any information. None of the gospel authors claim to have been fishermen. The fact of the matter is, as Dennis MacDonald shows in his on the Homeric epics and the Gospel of Mark in the first chapter,